Um, so I think it, we're, we're just a couple minutes before nine o'clock and we've got some folks straggling in, but I think we're gonna go ahead and get started and just welcome you all to today's training. So I just wanna say good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Erin Flynn and I'm a healthcare project director at the Department of Vermont Health Access and I'm very honored and pleased to welcome you all to the first day for this section of uh, the Vermont Healthcare Innovations Core Competency Training for Frontline Care Coordinators. I want to take a second to really truly thank you all up front for your commitment to this important training and to acknowledge your efforts to carve the time out of your demanding work schedules to be here. I know that that's not easy to do. And I'd also like to personally thank you all for your patience as we work to accommodate all of you, um, you know, that requested to attend this training and ultimately added a, a second section for the Burlington training site. Um, and we really appreciate your flexibility in working with us on that. So we're very excited to be here today, but before we begin, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the team members that put this training in place. Um, so some folks you saw at the registration table, including Holly Stone and Carol McGoffin, and they're there to answer questions all day. Um, others that couldn't be here today include Pat Jones, Julie Wasserman, De Deborah Lisi Baker, Georgia Meharris, and others. Um, I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge all their hard work. Without it, it wouldn't have been possible to pull this training together. So I just want to take a moment to reflect on um, each day that passes and, and how I've become exceedingly amazed at the hard work and dedication and passion that you all devote to improving the lives of Vermonters with complex needs. In my role, I've seen providers across communities statewide come together and reimagine the way they work together in partnership with individuals to ensure that their goals and needs are being met. As a result of your tireless commitment to this work, I've heard care coordinators referred to as magicians and have been told by the parent of a young girl with complex needs that care coordination saved my family's life. I've heard story after story about how through collaboration, engagement, and teamwork, you've reached some of the hardest to reach Vermonters and made things happen that were previously thought impossible. As you continue your relentless efforts to coordinate care of Vermonters with complex needs, we hope that this core competency training series will offer you additional tools to support you in this work. So before I introduce you to our trainers for today, I just wanna make a couple quick notes about logistics. Um, if you take a look at the agenda that's in the blue folder you received at registration, um, you'll see that although we have a lot to cover today, you do have um, breaks scheduled for both the morning and the afternoon. It's not as warm as we might anticipate on uh, a late April day in Vermont, but I feel like we always get a snowstorm this time of year, so not too surprising. But there is a nice courtyard um, just off the lobby if you have an opportunity to get some sun. Um, there's a bathroom located, I think some of you have already found it, it's around the corner to the right. If on breaks that line gets really long, you can go down one floor and there's um, a multi-stall bathroom down there. Um, so we've also allotted an hour and 15 minutes for lunch today so that you have plenty of time to run out and, and grab food if needed before our afternoon sessions and there are plenty of local dining options right here in downtown Burlington. Um, there's a few menus printed at the registration desk if you need any tips or advice and want to take a look. Um, so without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce you to our trainers um, from three different training organizations who've been working tirelessly to bring you today's training content. Our first training organization, Green Mountain Self Advocates, is Vermont's statewide self-advocacy organization. GMSA supports more than 20 local self-advocacy groups where people with developmental disabilities meet to listen to one another, make new friends, and learn about their rights. Through peer-to-peer -peer education, GMSA supports people with developmental disabilities to take control over their own lives, make decisions, solve problems, and speak for themselves. The GMSA board is run entirely by people with developmental disabilities and GMSA sat, staff sit on numerous advisory boards, both in Vermont and at the national level, provide training and disability awareness presentations, and advocate at the State House for policies that will improve the lives of people with disabilities. Our second training organization, the Vermont Family Network, 
is a statewide family support organization dedicated to promoting better health, education, and well-being for all children and families in our state. VFM provides a single point of contact for information and referral of family-to-family -family support and parent education. They also serve as Chittenden County's Children's Integrated Services Early Intervention Program. And finally, our third training organization, the Vermont Developmental Disability Council, is a federally funded self-governing organization charged with identifying the most pressing needs of people with developmental disabilities in our state and addressing them through advocacy and strategic investments. Each year, VTDDC uses its resources and efforts that promote self, excuse me, determination, independence, and full community inclusion for people with developmental disabilities. Activities include conducting research, providing training and technical assistance, developing coalitions, encouraging citizen participation, and keeping policymakers informed about disability issues. More than 60% of the council's membership is made up of people with developmental disabilities or their family members. Advocates and state agency representatives also serve on the council. So with that, I would like to turn the mic over to Kirsten Murphy, who um, is gonna begin our training for today and will introduce you to the rest of her team. So thank you all very much and have a wonderful day. And Lisa Maines from Vermont Family Network is gonna help me out by advancing the slides because um, multitasking is difficult for me. So. <laughs> um, I've not checked with our film person. I tend to walk around a lot. Is that okay for you? Okay, great. Um, so let's get started. All right, so um, we actually have four uh, different organizations on our team. We don't have anybody here from Vermont Federation for Families um, for Children's Mental help, but uh, we are a team for, I'm sort of the principal cat herder, so I can't thank my team enough for the number of times they've come together over these last uh, few weeks to put this together, you know, pretty quickly um, uh, to practice, you know, and to debate content. And you'll, you'll notice that uh, we all have slightly different um, target groups that we work with. Uh, uh, Vermont Family Network is, focuses on children and families. Um, DD Council focuses on developmental disabilities, kind of a, not all disabilities, but we're very sympathetic to that <laughs> entire movement. Green Mountain Self Advocates, they'll talk a little bit more about what they do. Um, but, but we, we, we come, come together, together as, as a coalition, coalition and, and um, I think we're doing the best we can to cover this incredibly big reach that is the umbrella of uh, Vermonters who live with a disability. We do have some common things that unite us as organizations. We um, share a deep commitment to the idea that it is critical that the voice of people who experience disabilities and their family members be at the table when decisions are being made, uh, both at the personal and policy level. So you'll notice that all of our organizations have uh, members who represent individuals and families. I myself um, have raised two sons on the autism spectrum who are now young men living successfully in other states. Um, we also really um, do a lot of work supporting individuals and families to advocate for themselves, but also to take it to that next level of working for systems and cultural change. And that's really part of what this project is about and why it interested us to, to put in a bid for, for the opportunity to train care managers. We felt it was critically important not only to get the voice of people with disabilities and families into the discussion about healthcare reform, but to try to shift the culture in, in the health system so that it was more um, disability friendly, if you will. Um, and finally, you know, as a team, we really, you'll notice we, we have debates about some things, but really um, there's been a whole process behind that. So we, we're not going to promise you to agree on everything, but we have a lot more, a lot more agreement than shades of disagreement. Um, okay, so yeah, these slides tend to not fit very well. Um, we all have a, 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 just a couple slides to tell you about our own organizations. Um, when, the, when Congress adopted the Americans with Developmental Disabilities uh, Bill of Assistance and uh, 
Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, which became known much more simply as the Federal DD Act. Congress knew that that was never going to have any reality at the state level unless they funded certain types of infrastructure at the state level. So number one, they funded a, a research institute in every state on disability and inclusion. Here in Vermont, that's the Center for Disability and Community Inclusion at UVM. Number two, they funded a legal branch, your advocacy and protection group, that's Disability Rights Vermont. And number three, they funded a council because they knew there had to be a decision-making body that was made up with pe of people with disabilities and developmental disabilities and their families and that could take legislation forward, could work for systems change. So continue to fund that now for many years in every single state and territory, and th that's the work that we do. And we are um, required under our federal funder and the DD Act to, to speak from the perspective of four foundational values that you'll hear all of us repeating over and over again. So I'll just give you a quick introduction based on what my council members define those values as. Self-determination is being your own boss, right? Being in charge of your own life. Independence, they say, adventuring out on your own. Later on, we'll hear more about what risk might be involved in that. Uh, community inclusion, I have a role to play. That's the theme of my talk, this introductory talk. And productivity, working hard to achieve your goals. You'll find that we are huge advocates of competitive employment, meaningful work. Here in America, how do most people define themselves when they're an adult? A lot of times it's through your work, that's critically important. Not, uh, not only you know, for your sense of self-worth and also for getting out of poverty. Here's a fun statistic just to kind of remind you that Vermont has work to do <laughs> because sometimes we pat ourselves a lot on the back in our wonderful state. Vermont has one of the highest gaps between the poverty rate for people without disabilities and the poverty rate for people with disabilities. We're eighth from the bottom. <laughs> so um, that says our state's doing pretty well. But people with disabilities are maybe not doing so well in our state. OK, now we're going to play a game. I need seven volunteers. And yesterday, I'll warn you, I just picked seven people, so someone should probably volunteer. OK, come on down here. I need seven people down here. I'm going to put this mic down because it's driving me crazy. We can pretend this is the prices, right? Come on down. Come on, three more, three more, come on. Don't be shy, I might pick on you. There it's we go. Easy. Two more, it's not hard. Come on. No you might questions. even get candy. There's no questions. Candy. Come on. Come on. Candy. <laughs> all right, all right, we'll work with that. Oh, okay, gosh. come on. All right, so I need you in a little bit of a circle here. Okay. Last time we played, or last time you were here, right, with uh, PCDC, they talked about the social determinants of health. Anybody remember that? Uh, actually, Kirsten, this is the first day for this training This session, is the so first day yeah. for you guys. Okay, yeah. Yeah. awesome. I've never seen you will now need to be intuitive about what the social determinants of health might be. This is going to be much more interesting. Any ideas out there? You, you, you already volunteered, so you can <laughs> skip it. Someone over here. Come on. Social determinants of health. Peer group. Peer group. That could be one. Genetics. Income. Genetics, not so much. Income. Income. That's a good, short, good one. Housing. Housing. Yeah. Transportation. 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 Okay, so you're getting good examples. Do you guys see a theme in some of these examples? Mm -hmm. Sort of? Okay, there are things in the environment that have something to do with how healthy you are. So it's not medicine, it's not surgery, it's not your local hospital, your primary care provider. It's all those other things that seem to have something to do with how healthy you are. All right, now. You get to hold on to the end of this. Okay. And then you get to take a little off and you get to throw it to somebody. But when you're throwing it, the idea is to name a social determinant of health. And do not let go of the end. Then you will hang on to it and pass it to someone else hanging on to your piece. Got it? Yeah. Okay. I'm just here to help people here. Thank you. Family support. Family support. Family support. Good choice. Transportation. Ah, picking one that was already said. <laughs> 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 A secure income. 
income. Secure income. Very nice. Education. 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 Good. Hang on there. Okay. Housing. Housing. Good. All right. Now we're gonna have, now the trick is to speed it up. Okay. Okay. Oh, Come on. Keep uh, going. Okay. 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 Doesn't uh, have to be a perfect star. Or whatever. Spirituality. Spirituality. Bravo. My trade. She should have come up with my trade. Support network. Support network. Good. Let you work. You've got the speaker. <laughs> oh, right. oh, no, no, it's fine, fine, it's fine. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, time, leisure time. Time for fun and leisure. Time, time for, for fun, fun and leisure. leisure. Uh, here you go. Um, access to healthcare. Access, access to healthcare. healthcare. Um, sexual orientation. Nice. Sexual, sexual orientation. orientation. things on this slide. One is those things in red, it's hard to tell in the lighting here. Um, those are sort of kind of tangible, like a job, housing, my zip code. Zip code is incredibly predictive of your health status. Um, access to healthy food or food security, uh, having safety in your neighborhood, uh, assets, meaning you're not broke the minute that your paycheck is spent on day two. Okay, so those are sort of tangible. And then there's these attitudes, these blue things. Uh, attitudes about new, new Americans, attitudes about Native Americans, attitudes about race, culture, sexual orientation, and ableism. So attitudes about people with disabilities. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so yeah, this actually worked. Yay, I corrected this slide. There are different versions of this, and so don't worry too much about the math because I have yet to see a convincing study that says that this is the definitive set of percentages. But the idea here is that on the right, social and economic factors are a very large chunk of what predicts your health status. It predicts your utilization, it predicts how um, adherent you're going to be to treatment routines, and it predicts how healthy you're going to be. It even predicts, it also has a lot to do with your mortality rate as a group. 40% in this particular version. Your health behavior is down there on the left, choices you make about your health, whether you choose to drink or smoke or, uh, you know, whatever, um, which is often mediated by, influenced by social and economic factors is another, yeah, 30%. The idea is those two together are a huge chunk of what influences health. Now notice the other stuff, clinical care, the stuff that doctors do, nurses do, 
The environment you live in, I'm not sure I would put that at 10, but there you go. Okay, and then genes and biology, another 10. So in the US, where do we spend the vast majority of our healthcare dollars? Clinical care, very good, yes. Does that make any sense? No. Not if you believe this particular um, representation of what influences people's health. In fact, in European countries that have way better health outcomes than we do, they spend a lot more in supporting people's social and economic lives, supporting them to be better, right? And a lot less on clinical care. And they get a lot better health outcomes in terms of many of the common indicators, infant mortality, rate of chronic disease, et cetera. Okay, so one of the big picture things that we're talking about in healthcare reform is trying to flip some of where we invest our energy, focus, time, resources, right? Is in wondering, you know, we keep spending a lot of money on this, on high tech medicine, and that's not a bad thing, but are we missing less, less costly opportunities that care managers are right at the forefront of, right? So, you know, we really want somebody to do something about their substance use disorder. Well, it's not going to happen unless they have stable housing, right? So, so it, it's looking at those big picture questions. Okay, we go to the next one? So I'm going to tell you three short little vignettes, short stories. Um, and you're going to kind of think, well, these are weird stories. Why is she telling us this? Um, but I think they have kind of, they kind of speak to a certain point about this social determinants of health. The first story is about a town in northeast Pennsylvania called Rosetto. If any, does anyone here like have a public health degree? You live near Rosetto. Awesome. That's the first person who even heard of this town. <laughs> and there's somebody with a public health degree. Did they tell you this story, the Rosetto effect? Did you study that? It's pretty common in public health classes, so. It's more, it was on Radio Lab, and Malcolm Gladwell had it in his book, Outliers. So it's not unheard of, that's true. So um, Rosetto's this tiny little town in Pennsylvania. It was settled around 1910-ish, um, mostly by immigrants from one valley in Italy, actually. You Italians came over, they liked it, they sent for their friends, eventually it became a town. And right away the fathers, the founding fathers, that was fathers of this town, um, set up a lot of social clubs, they got a Catholic church built, um, you know, they created as much as they could in America something that resembled their life uh, back in, in the old country, if you will. Rosetta was never a large town, about 1600 at this time. Now. Flat, jump forward to about 1961. A doctor, uh, I'm going to get this right this time, Stuart Wolf, who was a dean at the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine. You, I mean, I can hear it like down at the lake. I'm sorry. No, they're closed. I think we're like blowing people's eardrums, so I have a feeling we should try to. I, I'm so sorry. I, I can't e even hear what was. Oh, oh, that's off. Oh, oh, oh. I'm <laughs> okay. And I hope she's saying nice things. <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay, and, and people are hearing me, right? I, I, I don't like how echoey this is, but okay. Apologies. No worries. Actually, okay. as long as I interrupted, the conversation was about, is the sound too loud? Is it? Okay, we're going to try to turn that down for you. That's what we were just saying. I am not liking the sound system either, so if they, ta they take a minute to deal with it. We tried it, it wouldn't work. Because it was working fine. Okay, all right. I'll believe you. I'll do anything to fix the sound, because I don't <laughs> like using that mic at all. Well, I, I'm just doing what I was told, I'm sorry. <laughs> Plus, I want to tell my story well. <laughs> I want to point out that this has got a pin tape to it. That's the That's fix. To a clip <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's, it's clever. I like it, you know? <laughs> oh, 
Hello? Hello? Oh my god, that's so much better. Can you pin this to me? Because then I don't have to like do something with my hands. And I like to talk with my hands. <laughs> Sorry about this. No, it's better to fix it now. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Was that a question or a stretch? OK, so can people hear me a little bit better? Is that OK? Is that OK? All right, so, so 1961, Dr. Wolf is having a beer with his buddy. I don't know this guy's name, but a doctor, a local doctor from Rosetto, the area. And his buddy says, there's the weirdest thing about this town. I never see anyone with a heart attack. Like, nobody has cardiac disease in this town. What? It's just bizarre. So um, Dr. Wolf was skeptical. You know, he's from a medical school. He's, this is his vacation home in the Poconos, so you know, he's just visiting. But he was intrigued enough to go check the death records. And um, what he discovered is the guy was actually telling him something quite real. So he got together a team, and they did some research, and took a while to get the paper published. It was actually quite controversial, but a couple years later, they were able to publish their findings, which were this that men 55 and under, there had never been somebody in that age range, a male, who'd had a heart attack in Rosetta. None. And for men 56 and older, the rate of heart attack was half the national average. Well, that's, that's great. What we, must, we need to do whatever it is that they're doing in Rosetta, right? What explains this? Now, this was before the genome. so. We could have a conversation about genetics. That wasn't checked for. So I'm, this, is not, this is more, um, uh, you know, not hard science. It's, it's suggestive. But they thought, let's look at lifestyle. They'd gotten on board with that set of social determinants. Well, it turned out that this fountain of youth did not have any particularly great secrets to teach us about lifestyle. The people of Rosetto drank wine copiously. They um, smoked, the men smoked these unfiltered Italian cigars. That's not very good for you, last time I checked. Um, they worked, the men mostly worked in the mining industry, so a place where you got a lot of uh, dust and other toxins introduced to your, uh, into your body. And, you know, th this was long before the Mediterranean diet, right? Nobody was importing olive oil in 1962. Two, right? That just didn't happen. It wasn't on the shelf at Shaw's. And it was going to cost a huge amount of money. So just like everybody else in America, the people of Rosetto were frying their meatballs in lard, OK? Just like everybody else. So it didn't appear that some of these standard lifestyle choices had anything to do with this. But the sociologists did notice that the way the town related as a community was distinctive and not consistent with the rest of what American towns looked like. So um, they, uh, you know, people lived in um, multi-generational houses. They had constant celebrations in this town. There was always some kind of festival going on, through, often through the church. People had uh, very complex networks of clubs. There were over 18 clubs in a town of 1,600 people. Um, and, and people seemed to have a, a connection, a deep connection to the community. And it was really like everyone in the community. People weren't left out, no matter how old, how young you were. You had a role to play in this extremely cohesive community. Now, we can't prove that that has some impact on health, but the authors of the paper did predict that if that social cohesion were to break down, the rate of heart attack would go up. And they did a follow-up study 20-some years later and indeed, Rosetto had changed. People did not live in multi-generational houses. There was a more ethnic diversity in the town. There were more, pe more people worked in different types of jobs now, not just one industry. There were strip malls. People didn't shop downtown. There weren't as many clubs. Um, it was a much more, it looked like the rest of America, frankly. And the cardiac rate was also, the cardiac disease rate was exactly what you expect from the national average. Second story is about a group of men that referred to themselves as the guinea pig club. These were elite flyers from the Royal Air Force in England during World War II. 
World War II saw a set of horrific injuries that had not been really seen before because people did not, well, the air aircraft was not as sophisticated before, but also people didn't survive when an aircraft went down. So there was a cadre of um, very, you know, um, highly trained pilots who survived airline, or, you know, uh, fighter jet, you know, crashes, and they had horrific burns. Uh, all over their body, but especially faces and hands, which were uncovered. And the British government was, was very, you know, very invested in these heroic men and sort of trying to do more than the current medical science really suggested could be done for this, this group of, of fighters. So they created a special unit in a town called East Grinstead in Sussex, and after initial treatment, burn victims would go to this particular hospital. Um, there were over 600 patients treated through this unit over the years. Um, and they brought in a surgeon, um, a McIndoe, a Dr. McIndoe, who was doing experimental work in plastic surgery. Now this was not like the plastic surgery in Hollywood, right? <laughs> this is life-saving plastic surgery. If you don't have enough skin, you can't regulate your body temperature, you can't fight infection, and of course faces and hands have all kinds of functional uses that people, you know, they had figured out how to graft skin but not on, you know, hands and faces, and that was much more complex. Dr. McIndoe um, began his experimental procedures. Um, I'll tell you because you'll see a visual in a minute. One of the procedures had to do with grafting skin from, say, a shoulder to the face, and actually they would leave the two pieces, they would leave a link between the two so that the blood supply could continue to nourish the skin on the face until a subsequent surgery. So you'll, you'll see some pictures that you won't quite understand if you don't know that. Um, McIndoe's initial um, outcomes were terrible. So this was, you know, he was trying everything he could, but you know, these patients kind of um, lingered on the wards, and he noticed they did not seem particularly invested in getting better. The other thing to know is this involved many, many surgeries. So patients typically had to stay in this hospital for a couple of years. So um, the good doctor thought, well, what can I do? What can I do? You know, my surgery techniques appear sound, and yet I'm not really getting the outcomes I want. So the first thing he did is he brought a keg of beer into the ward. That seemed like good medicine, right? Right? And then, you know, beer usually goes with dancing. So he started throwing parties on the wards and inviting the nurses, who at that time were all women. And that seemed like a very good idea. <laughs> and certainly the patients thought it was a great idea. And then he began kind of a, a whole um, campaign to uh, connect patients with families in the town of East Grinstead so that they would have some place to go. And it occurred to him that Rather than have all his patients, who were going to be there for two years, wearing those silly hospital gowns that nobody really likes to wear, um, they should wear their uniforms. After all, that conveys the kind of dignity that war heroes deserve. So they started wearing their uniforms again routinely, and uh, going into town, seeing families that they'd been connected with. Now remember, this is wartime, so there's a lot to do in towns, like victory gardens and scrap metal collections. and you know, teaching people how to run to their bomb shelters. There's a lot of things that have to be done in, you know, your average British town. And there are no men around because they're all at the front, right? So here we have these young men from, from the hospital coming in and beginning to have important volunteer roles, connecting with families. Um, you know, even several marriages came out of this. Um, so the guinea pig club. This video clip um, is kind of a time, it's a little dated, so I apologize for that. It might not be exactly how we portray disability today, but I think it makes a point. I'm going to try to let, change the lighting slightly so you can see it better. There we go. And then you're going to want to. I don't have my glasses on, that's Stim Lecture, yeah. correct? Okay, now why is this not turning on? We need to change the glasses. 
working on the sound. Start it again. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there a sound on this? There we go. That's that's good. Thinking that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war. We are Mackindoes, aren't we? We, we are, are his guinea pigs. Get the music. With, with uh, the tones and pedicles, glass eyes, false teeth and wigs. And when we get our discharge, we'll shout with all our might. Per our due at Astra, we'd rather drink than fight. John Hunter runs, runs the gas works, Ross Tilly wields the knife. And, and if, if you are not careful, they'll have your bloody life. So give me pig stand ready for all your surgeons' calls. And if their hands aren't steady, they'll rip off both your ears. <laughs> Remember we had some men Australians, some, some French, French, some Czechs, some Poles. We've, We've even got some Yankees, got down their blood with soul. But <laughs> and if you the Canadians, well, that's another thing. They couldn't stand our accent and they built a separate wing. Whenever we felt particularly conscious of being ugly and deformed, we always knew that there was a waiting welcome at, for us at Bill's, and that he would soon laugh away any tendency we had toward gloom or depression. Many houses were thrown open to us. In them, we were never allowed to feel in any way peculiar. We were treated as members of the family, and from the contacts we, ma contacts we made, friendships grew which are unlikely to be broken. So the guinea pig club continued to meet until 2005, um, uh, until 2005 when the last member finally passed away. These men came to see themselves, and there were 600 of them, came to see themselves not only as having meaning in the local community, but also having meaning in advancing science because the techniques that were pioneered saved many other lives later. So that's when they talk about being Mackindoe's army, that's what they're singing about. 
All right, third story. Um, this is a, a friend of mine uh, on, the, on the left. That's Lisa. She's a member of my council. She lives in um, Bennington. And uh, who is she pictured with? Governor Shumlin. OK. So I, I wanted to get Lisa's voice here as a tape, and we tried it a couple times on the phone, and it just wasn't successful. So that'll have to be the next version of this talk. <laughs> but I do have Lisa's permission to share a little bit about her story. It's a story she told directly to the governor during um, a meeting that our council had with him to discuss health care reform. And if I had wanted to script something to describe the social determinants of health, I couldn't have done a better job. So Lisa came to Vermont in 1991. She moved here because her parents, who are actually pretty prominent musicians, um, were getting older. And she has a sibling in Vermont. And, uh, what she'll tell you is she was pretty, she was unhappy and she was very angry at that time. She wasn't comfortable in her body. She was just didn't feel well. She was mad about moving. And she had what we sometimes call in the disability world, um, euphemistically, challenging behaviors. <laughs> um, she'll also tell you she was quite overweight, which you would never know now. She smoked. She drank. You know, she had some acting out behavior. Um, she moved into a group home with three other women where she still lives. So this is, what, 25 years since. And she began to get involved just in the house, doing chores and whatnot. And then some of her housemates kind of started a program of a kind of walking club. So they do that. They still do that. In fact, I had to schedule my phone calls around her walking schedule. She completely puts me to shame. And um, she lost well over 100 pounds, she explained to the governor. Her borderline diabetes disappeared. Her cholesterol rate fell to normal levels. She stopped smoking. She stopped drinking. She joined a church. She took up crafting. Now she has her own small business. And she became a self-advocate. She joined the self-advocacy movement. She joined a local group in her area, a group for people who advocate for the rights of people with developmental disabilities, and eventually went on to um, become a member of our council. And she's very proud, especially of this moment, where she shared that story with the governor. Because it really wasn't that she got me better medical care. It's that she had a better life. And it did a huge amount to Im Im improve her health. OK. So we're going to play a little game. Hoping I have the right form here. All right. So. Is anyone familiar with the term health disparity or healthcare disparity? Is that something you guys are familiar with? Anyone? It's okay. I won't call on you if you raise your hand. If you've heard the term, right? Okay, that's cool. Okay, that's good. So we, we, we see it in the media now a fair amount. There's a health disparity, like one group gets this outcome and the other group gets a different outcome, right? So I want to give us a little bit more precise definition of that. So we're going to play this game called Disparity or Difference, OK? Because it's more than a difference. Susie and Hannah are both middle school age girls living in rural Vermont. Both see Dr. Smiley and have done so since early childhood for their dental care. At their recent dental exam, Susie was found to have her first cavity. Hannah had a clean bill of dental health, but she already has half a dozen fillings. Disparity or difference? Someone. Health disparity or difference? I think it's, a difference? it's a difference. The more important question is why? Take a shot. Genetics. What? Genetics. Genetics. Choices. Diet. Choices. Probably choices are involved. OK, any other, any, any other ideas? Education. Education. OK, so those are all contributing Access. factors. But the issue here that I'm trying to point out is that this is just a simple difference. It's, a, it's two different outcomes. We do not call this a health disparity. And the reason why is, is we're talking about individuals. We're not talking about populations. So health disparity is a term that we reserve for population health where we're comparing two groups of people. Okay? First thing to know. This one's really going to get, this catches everyone, actually. Um, OK, age-specific incident rates of seizure among children with autism are between 3 and 28 times the rates for children in the general population. <coughs> Is that a health disparity or a difference? 
Any other suggestions? Here in disparity over on this side. Yeah, OK. So it's actually, I would call that a difference. And I, and I think that's correct. It's a difference. Of, it's a clinical difference with an unknown etiology. There's an association, right? We, 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 but there's, a, there's something about it that appears to be essentially biological. And the point is, it's not rooted in a history of unfairness. Disparities are, uh, health disparities are a term we reserve, and we talk about it in jobs and other things too, other areas of life, that are rooted in a history of unequal access or unfair treatment. So third example, 75% of adult women between the ages of 50 and 74 have received a mammogram in the past two years, while the rate for adult women with disabilities is 61%. Disparity, right? Because that exactly fits my, the definition I just gave you. <laughs> right, OK, so that's rooted in a, in a set of assumptions that are biased, right? It seems to be that, for some reason, one group is not getting access to appropriate um, preventative care. And the only reason for that is not that women with disabilities have a known lower rate of breast cancer. <laughs> It's got nothing to do. Breast cancer is independent of your disability status, right? It just has something to do with unequal access or unfair treatment. Let me go to the next one. Um, OK. So I'm going to back up a little bit here. Um, one question that people ask is, in studying health disparities, why did the state choose to focus on this whole training around disability? Like, if we're interested in this, this idea of having fair, better health care, better health care at, uh, and with better health care experience at a lower cost, that is the aim that we are shooting for here, why would we pick the lens of disability? Can somebody turn this down? It's driving, it's echoing. Well, one reason is disability is common. Disability occurs, according to the CDC, in one in five Americans at any one time have a disability. Does that number surprise anybody here? Yes, no? You all knew that. You all knew that. That means somebody in your seat, or somebody two seats down, probably has a disability, you just can't see it, right? Right? It's very, very common. Um, Vermont's prevalence, CDC says, is 17.8%. That's a little, a little low. Now, the other thing to know about these numbers, um, so I can buy Sky more time later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, is that um, this is probably an undercount because it doesn't include people who are deaf. I don't know the I don't know the politics of that, but people who are deaf are not counted in this as having a disability, um, and um, it doesn't include adults who are in institutional settings. So that's in Vermont that we don't have institutions for people with developmental disabilities, but we do have nursing homes, and we have a tiny like seven or eight people that are in an intermediate care facility. Um, but in other states like Georgia, they have huge institutions still for people with disabilities, developmental disabilities typically. And in uh, Vermont, it, does, it, it would exclude people who are incarcerated, who are in corrections. Yes, ma'am. It, 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 can everybody hear the question? Yeah, go. <laughs> no, I'm just, it's just, um, just think that's very odd that those populations are excluded. And where Actually, does that this, come from? I, I, Sky, help me if I'm wrong about this, but I'm pretty certain the census simply does not count institutionalized adults. Is that correct? Yeah. It is arbitrary. It is arbitrary, but then many things are arbitrary in the way government systems do things. Yes, it does seem very arbitrary. And my point is simply that it's probably a low count. Because we also know in Vermont, and this is of keen interest to the um, House Committee on Human Services, that there is a uh, concern about the number of people who are in uh, corrections in Vermont who might not have um, might not meet Vermont's definition of having a developmental disability, but still have what's called, quote unquote, functional impairment, not my favorite term, but um, are certainly very poorly served in corrections. So these are people who would, again, I don't really like using IQ, but this is how it's defined, have an IQ somewhere between 70 and 100. That's not low enough to get you out of being incarcerated, but it is still below the norm. Um, and also, there's a huge amount of mental health issues in, in, in people who are incarcerated. So that whole group of people with disabilities is also not included here. Can I just quickly? Yeah. Exactly. I Googled it because I was curious. I 
Okay, great. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me okay? I'm Sky, one of the trainers later on. So I was just curious. So so it's actually the data is collected from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Um, and it's, it's like there's this whole report, and I'm not going to read it to you. I could. I could just read it to you. <laughs> but I can, if you give me your email, I can email you the links. And it tells you a little bit more about the data collection statistics. So this is from 2013. But it gives you sort of more methodology type information. But it's actually not from the census. That's what I wanted to. Yeah, it's the BRFSS. So. That's true. I mean, the phone survey, so which would answer. That's really kind of why we don't, don't collect, collect it from. Yeah. yeah. So it's just to ask people about their health behavior. The other thing to know is the use of this Burfist, Burfist data to look at disability. You'll see some slides later on a Vermont subset of that data. Um, that's pretty recent. Like we didn't used to collect much data at all about disability. So the fact that there are health disparities experienced by people with disabilities was somewhat hidden until quite recently. Um, so the fact that disability is common is one reason the state thought this was an important thing to reflect on. Um, we're going to skip that slide. And OK, back to this notion of disparities, right? Um, again, this is the definition that we talked about. It's between population groups that reflect a longstanding history of unfair treatment and or unequal access. So. so this is just some basic nationwide data that's coming out pretty recently about the kinds of disparities we're talking about. And they are really large. Adults with disabilities are four times more likely to report poor health than adults without disabilities. Adults with disabilities are at a two and a half times greater risk for developing chronic disease. Well, if I were trying to think about my health care costs as a state, my Medicaid costs, I would be looking at people with disabilities. You bet I would, because that's a group that has a high rate of chronic diseases. 71% of adults over 40 with intellectual disabilities have at least two chronic diseases. Again, I absolutely want to do a better job working with this population so that I can begin to address the disparities that have in health care that have turned to that, have created that outcome. Next slide. So adults with intellectual disabilities are six times more likely than their peers to be hospitalized. The risk of developing mental illness or suicidal tendencies is three times higher in adults with intellectual disabilities compared to adults without intellectual disabilities. So again, we, we end up with sort of these comorbid multiple factors right, that make these very complex folks to work with. Um, OK, so this is some other data set that came from Special Olympics. Special Olympics has recreated itself as a public health organization. Who knew? <laughs> um, so it's not just a sports organization. They do incredible screenings at most of their larger events. They do it here in Vermont as well. And they do it worldwide. So they have the largest data set about the health status of people typically with developmental disabilities. That's the subset that tends to be participating in Special Olympics. Um, they, you know, they have the largest data set in the world. This is American data. Now remember that people that participate in Special Olympics have to have people in their life that get them there, that get them to practice, that are cheering them on, right? They've got some social connections to be part of Special Olympics, right? Um, and you have to be motivated enough to go to team practice all the time. So these are folks that are really doing some healthy things. And yet 6 out of 10 meet clinical obesity guidelines, 6 out of 10. Special Olympic athletes nationwide. Four have obvious tooth decay, and one needs an immediate referral for a dental disease, like an extraction or like it's like causing dental pain, active dental pain. Three fail a hearing test. Uh, four need glasses, but no one's evaluated that. And one uh, has an active, no, two have an active eye disease. Um, five have significant problems with flexibility. Four have significant problems with balance. Another thing I'd like to point out about this data set is that in countries that have free dental care, so not like the country of Vermont, not like Vermont where we have a $500 cap on Medicaid for uh, adults uh, for dental care, where you have free dental, so access is not the issue. That number doesn't change. So, What's going on with that? It's, 
So one of the things that I've noticed is this is the fourth time we've done this training. And you, in general, we've had audiences that are really hip to kind of access issues. But this isn't just an access issue. There's something else going on here. OK, so this is, uh, comes from, this is pretty recent data that um, the Department of Health here in Vermont collected to begin to look at the status of people with disabilities broadly understood. Um, and it comes from their campaign that they're calling the 3450. Three health behaviors, remember that behavior chunk that was 30%, three health behaviors that contribute to four chronic diseases that result in 50% of the deaths of Vermonters. So let's look at the comparison of people with disabilities and without disabilities when we look at these behaviors. And I've got to say, none of us do too well on this. Uh, oh, back one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so if we talk about eating the recommended um, amount of fruits and veggies, people with disabilities have 85% uh, of them don't do that. And people without disabilities, 79% meet the guidelines. So actually, we're all doing a bad job. Um, but people with disabilities are doing significantly worse. And these are averages. I'm sure there are people here that eat lots of good veggies. Um, OK, the second health behavior, meeting the recommended um, physical activity guidelines. 51% uh, of the population that doesn't have disabilities, um, no, 42% of the population that doesn't have disabilities meets those guidelines. And 51% do, no, do not. These are both negative. So in other words, the point is that the people with disabilities are much worse. And then in smoking behaviors, 18 for the general population and 29, 29%, sorry. OK, so again, the idea is that the health behaviors are somewhat worse. Now, and now let's, let's look at the rates of the chronic diseases, if we can turn those up. All right, so lung disease, all Vermont adults, 15% rate. but um, close to twice for people with disabilities. Uh, diabetes and prediabetes. Again, the difference is mm, we're on an order of sort of double, right? Cardiovascular disease, a little more than double. Cancer, a little less than double. OK, so the point is that there's something the health department should be really concerned about here, right? Because people with disabilities, broadly understood, that's mental health, physical disabilities, all, you know, developmental, the whole pie, right? have a lot more chronic disease. Um, this is data that I collected from Medicaid claims. And what I was trying to look at, and this is specific to people with developmental disabilities, is the utilization of emergency rooms by two different groups of people with developmental disabilities. On the left here are people who get a full package of um, home and community-based supports. They have assistance accessing their community. That's about 20% of Vermonters with developmental disabilities. The other 80% of Vermonters with developmental disabilities don't qualify for those home and community-based services. That waiver. So uh, what I'm talking about is the difference between people who have waiver and not waiver. That term is becoming a little hard because of the way we talk about waiver in Vermont, but yeah. Exactly, that's right. So there's a group, a smaller group gets this package of things to assist them with jobs, case management, um, possibly emergency services, um, accessing the community, having a direct support provider be with them at times. And then about 80% of folks don't get that. They meet criteria to get Medicaid and they're on public assistance in different ways, but they don't get this access, this help to access the community. But they're still, they're still Medicaid, so they're, they're, they're costing the state money. The average Vermonter uses the emergency room 0.48 times a year. Both of these groups use it significantly more. But notice that the people who don't get help in the community use emergency rooms significantly more than people who do. Next slide. So I asked myself, well, is this all this you know, emergency room use? Um, I mean, maybe people need to go to the emergency room. We don't want to stop them from doing that. Except that it turns out for both groups, between 38 and 44% were for non-emergent reasons. So not a good idea to be in the emergency room, not where you need to be getting your care. Now look at the cost associated. The first group, people with waivers, right? They're costing $40.27 mean cost for their emergency room visit. The other group, 
the group that I worry about a lot, right? Because they're really kind of disconnected from, from a lot of types of community support. Seven times higher mean cost for an emergency room visit. Um, so I like to point out that also the disability has an impact on mortality. So um, people who collect SSDI are at least three times as likely to die as other people their age. Um, our folks, our friends in the mental health community have made that very clear. Having a chronic mental illness shaves about 10 point, I forget, 10.1 years off of your life expectancy. That's well established. Now, the, the, the question comes up, well, is this just about socioeconomic status? After all, people with disabilities are poor. Um, they live in public assistance. So, pfft, it, you know, that must be it. It's just about poverty. So I like to bring up this slide, which is about a, a common problem that public health folks have really been challenged to address, which is the rate of infant mortality among African-American babies. Okay? So that darker blue, you can't tell that it's blue, but the, the tall line tracks infant mortality for African-American infants from 85 to 2005. And while it has gone down, it remains two and a half times higher than the rate of infant mortality for Caucasian babies. What's interesting is when you control for socioeconomic status, that number doesn't change. So it doesn't appear to be about socioeconomic status. And also, if you do a sub-study of infant mortality uh, among uh, immigrants recently coming from Africa, their rate is closer to the, it's close to the Caucasian rate. So there seems to be something about this history of experiencing race in America that is you know, quite distinctive and seems to have some kind of impact on, on infant mortality. That, that's sort of interesting, isn't it? Okay, so. Um, I'm going to take a risk here and add one idea that I didn't put in a slide, because I was told not to, but I'm going to add it anyway, because I want to use this fourth time to see if, if it means anything and is helpful to people. When I think about this data from uh, mortality rate, there's a concept in public health that has this fancy term, allostatic load. Okay? That's quite a mouthful. There's a long definition that explains the medical underpinnings of what an allostatic load is. But I, rather than focus on allostatic, let's focus on load, like heavy burden, right? The idea is that all of the environmental factors that impinge on a person build up over time and seem to have some kind of influence on health overall. Later on, in September, we'll be discussing something called the ACES study, where you'll hear about how early childhood burdens, trauma, can impact health on later in life. Um, GMSA will do an exercise with you later where you'll hear and see quite literally what the load is to live with a disability in our country. That history of racism or other isms, attitudes, seems to be a piece of that load that impinges on health. That is a theory there. What I'm trying to get folks to understand is that all those isms are not just barriers to access. They are also, in and of themselves, contributors to poor health. All right, the opposite of allostatic load is a more positive term. Uh, social role valorization is a set of ideas that we talk about in human services. The basic idea, as a theory, it's, like, it's, it's deadly to read as a theory. It's like all in jargon. So let's just break it down to be easy. <laughs> all people are of equal value, but our society is arranged in such a way that it signals that some people are more valuable than others. I noticed the other day that the wheelchair access at Necky on Main, a lovely restaurant in Montpelier where I live, is actually back behind the building by the garbage cans. And there's this nice little sign on the front door that says, please, you know, with a wheelchair, and it says, please enter by, uh, in the rear. And it's literally next to multiple garbage cans. Is that a socially, what does that say about your social value? Well, you can come in, but you've got to come in, you know, 
next to the garbage can. OK, so one way that I understand socially validated roles is a story. This is one gratuitous story about my own son. You can go ahead here. This is Josh. You can't see him too well. One more punch, and we'll get his cute face. There he is. That's Josh. He's 21 now. Obviously, I had him when I was 15. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so Josh, he's my middle son. Um, Josh um, has autism. Um, and the autism that he has happens, it impacts his language a lot. So he speaks in a word or two and not a whole paragraph. Doesn't see the point of a paragraph. He's, um, you know, the word or two is always exactly the right word. Um, he has some sensory differences. Um, and he has difficulty with um, auditory processing. So your average fourth grade classroom was hell for him, right? Because everybody's me, me, talking. And you're supposed to start noticing the teacher saying something important, but that wasn't clear to him. And so the, the fourth grade classrooms were so noxious that he discovered very quickly that if he hauled off and hit the kid next to him, he would get excused from class, <laughs> sent to the principal's office. And the principal, who was also afraid of my son, and the principal probably weighed 250 pounds, um, would give Josh his office for the day. Well, now Josh is the only kid in school with his own fax machine and secretary. He thinks yeah. this is wonderful. This is so reinforcing, he continues to do it. In fact, he escalates this to you know, quite, a, quite a high degree. So you know, police were involved, psychiatric hospitalizations were involved, all kinds of things were involved. But by the time fifth grade was rolling around, they said, no, 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 he can't come back here. He needs to go to one of those places. Go look at those places where he can live and they can work with him. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. So we had to get more lawyers involved and whatever. And eventually we came up with what was an imperfect solution, but I agreed to it because I was running out of options, that Josh would have his own classroom in a trailer behind the school. And he had his own personal teacher, who I'm sure cost the school district a fortune. Um, he had his therapist. He had his aide. And all the other kids in school noticed that all of a sudden, Josh wasn't around. He was the kid in the trailer, and only grown-ups went in the trailer. God, he must have done something really bad. <laughs> I mean, that, can you imagine how stigmatizing that is? Right, so he became the kid in the trailer who only sees grown-ups. And this went on for, you know, he didn't have a trailer the next year, but he still had a separate classroom. And, you know, eventually I convinced them that he should be allowed to go to the lunch room. But as long, and they said, well, yes, but not during lunch. <laughs> like, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And, you know, he was allowed to go up and down the hallway. And then we tried shop. I was like, really? Power tools? But we did. OK. And then math, and then science. And by high school, he was ready to be fully mainstreamed again. And Josh kind of was up for the, ta you know, he wanted, he wanted to be back in the mainstream. He didn't know kids were still whispering about him. He had no idea. So he tried being class clown for five weeks. That didn't work. And in desperation, I signed him up for a sport. Now, I was like, sports? Of course, it's a jock high school. I've got to find a sport he can do. Um, now, he'd never been successful in sports. We tried hockey. He licked the ice. That was the end of hockey. So, but no, it was, it was so, I, but he's, a, he's, a, he's fast. He's leggy, he's skinny, and he has an incredibly high threshold for pain. So I thought, cross-country running, of course. So we signed him up for that, and the coach was wonderful. He was a former special educator, and eventually convinced Josh that practice meant wearing sports attire, not your blue jeans. And we put him in races, and he was incredibly successful. He started winning medals. And he started going to team parties, because it's a cool school rule. You have to be invited to the party. So, and you know, I understood a socially validated role the day that I saw Josh running spring track in the entire school and all of their professional parents in Hanover were cheering for him. He wasn't the kid in the trailer anymore. He was a track star in that school. And he graduated on honor roll and a three varsity athlete. Pretty cool, right? A socially validated role was what really made it work for him, though. He had to have a role in that school that people cared about. They didn't care about the class clown, but they really cared about the track athlete. OK. Now, he took this thing one more time a little too far, because now he's living in Seattle, and he's um, been doing um, Spartan, oh, yeah. Spartan yeah. races. Yeah, we'll discuss dignity of risk later. OK, next slide. <laughs> OK, uh, last story. This is a story about Lois Curtis. The Olmstead decision is a Supreme Court decision. I can't believe it was as recently as 1999. But in Olmstead, the Supreme Court ruled that you have to offer people a placement in the community. right? 
if you're gonna if you're gonna tell people we have this horrible institution for people with disabilities, you have to give them an option, right? States must come up with community-based options. And that has continued to be more and more aggressively pushed. Um, the plaintiffs in this case were, were two women from, from um, Georgia. And Lois Curtis was one of them. Lois um, was 11 when she experienced her first hospitalization for um, mental illness. She also has a developmental disability. And really, she bopped in and out of institutional settings all of her teenagehood. She really didn't get an education. By 19, she was described as despondent, having poor hygiene, sort of catatonically overdrugged and wandering around the state hospital grounds. Legal aid brought suit because Lois was one of a couple plaintiffs that they found whose doctors said they don't need to be here. But three years went by, and the state still couldn't come up with someplace else for them to be. And this wound its way through various levels of court and became a very, very important decision in our country and, and in the rights of people with disabilities. What people don't know is that Lois was very unsuccessful in the community initially. And human service workers really struggled to find a way to help Lois be successful in the setting she chose to be in, which was in the community, not in a hospital. And it wasn't until they noticed in her chart that there was some entry where, oh yeah, Lois likes to draw, it keeps her hands busy. Well, actually, Lois didn't just like to draw. Lois was really a very gifted artist with a very distinctive idiom. Um, and she was able to show her work. She began showing it. And then she began selling it. And it's hard to see, but she's pictured here with President Obama on an Olmsted anniversary, giving him a piece of her artwork, which now hangs in the White House. She now owns her own home, which was a dream of hers, uh, in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Right? She needed a role in the community in order to be successful. Next slide. So again, I'm going to repeat my take home message for this and other discussions about these social determinants. There are not only barriers to accessing the things here, like employment and education. These attitudes and ideas are not only barriers, but they appear to have an impact in and of themselves, right? Which is why we teach about attitudes so much, why we're trying to change the culture about how we think about people with disabilities. It's not, it doesn't come automatically. We all grew up in, in our culture, right? So, we, we have, so it's, we're asking you to think about some of those ideas today. One more time. So there are things that care managers can check off. Oh, we got someone transportation. Now I'm not, I'm not putting anyone down here. We, it's great to have dealt with transportation. That's very hard in Vermont. But if you don't have any place to go that you want to go, you haven't asked that person the right question yet. We can check off. Oh, we got someone a job. In fact, we're required to check that off in developmental services if you're getting a waiver. It's one of the few things they track in the contract. How, what was the rate of employment? Oh, we got them a job. But if that job is two hours at the agency where you receive your services and you're emptying waste baskets so somebody can check something off, and I'm sorry, we see that sometimes, right? That's not quite what we meant, right? You can have a job, but if it doesn't have value to customer and coworker, you have missed this incredible opportunity to help somebody have a meaningful role in the community. You can get someone housing, but it might not be a home. And we do this again among people with pretty significant developmental disabilities. We use an adult foster care model a lot. We pay a family to provide support and housing for someone. Well, now that Medicaid is starting to ask questions about the quality of that, because what does it mean to have a home? It means you have your own key. It means you can have a snack whenever you want to, whether it's good for you or not. You can watch TV all night if you want to. If you're an adult, I mean, <laughs> not if you're 16 and my son, right? You know, it means that you can have friends over when you want to, right? That's what a home is. So we're starting to ask those questions about the, the quality and what it is that people are really saying that they want and how do we contribute to those meaningful roles in the community instead of adding to this load that people with disabilities carry. There. Time check. 10, 12, I did pretty well. Are there any questions? It might be candy. 
There might be candy if you ask questions. Yeah, we're going to talk. We're we're talking as a team about figuring out how to get the slides out. And and I the lighting in here. We we're doing what we can with it. Um, you don't necessarily have to address this right now, but if you could explain in your language and your words um, the Medicaid waiver system and how that all works, that would be very helpful. I would love to do that, but probably I don't have time to do that. Just summarize here. I, I, I'm not sure I can do every single waiver, but I can talk some about that. Do, yeah. do you want a three-minute lesson on Medicaid waiver? A little bit? I can talk about it in developmental yeah, services. Not, yeah. And we do have that on our website. OK, okay so um, the word waiver, right, let's start with that. Medicaid, that. That's when the government, CMS, the people, the gods of Medicaid, right, they waive certain rules to allow states to experiment and do something a little differently. Now, I'm going to do this specific to developmental disabilities because it's the world I know. I like to say that Medicaid comes in different flavors. Okay? There is Medicaid that acts as health insurance. right? And that goes to poor, you know, poor people, basically. Um, uh, and it also goes to children with disabilities. And it goes to adults with disabilities. And there are different rules around those. Some of those populations have a little bit different rules. We call that state plan Medicaid. It's just like health insurance, except that it's run by a public entity. And it's a public-private partnership. There's federal law, and the state, you know, feds pay a, a big chunk, and the state pays a big chunk, right? And federal rules always kind of trump state rules. So there's certain federal rules we have to follow, and then there's the state's rift on that. But it's health insurance. So it pays for you to go to the doctor, that kind of thing. Then there's what's called, used to be called, or at least, wavered Medicaid. So we call it home and community-based supports. And that pays for things that health insurance typically doesn't. So it can pay for a menu of things for people with developmental disabilities. There's a document online that specifies what that is in the human services you know, website. But it's basically case management, job support, emergency services, um, uh, direct support professional, someone to help you and assist you with accessing the community, which might mean shopping or recreational things. A lot of people, most people with developmental disabilities don't drive, so it provides some ability for transportation, right? Um, and does anyone here remember the average size of waiver? Of waiver? Nicole? Yeah, it's about between $47,000 and $50,000 a year. Okay? And, it, and it can pay for these foster care type arrangements, which it does for a significant number of folks. Um, to get on that waiver, you have to pass through two gates, right? if, you, if you're an adult with a dis, uh, developmental disability. First, you have to meet Vermont's criteria for what is a developmental disability. And I'm here to tell you Vermont's criteria is actually pretty narrow by national standards and pretty antiquated. I'll take the risk and say that. It's written in our own state DD law, and it is different from the federal DD law. Okay, in federal law, a developmental disability is based on function, and it, it says that it's a disability that starts before the age of 22, and it impairs someone's function in three important life domains, like uh, communication, um, mobility, cognition, it, it names these sorts of attributes. It's pretty broad and it's pretty functional. In Vermont, it is largely based on diagnostic criteria. So it is an IQ of 70 or below. We can have a whole long conversation about the legitimacy of IQ scores. But anyway, 70 or below with a tiny bit of margin for error there. Or a diagnosis on the autism spectrum and then some, some functional criteria kick in. Right, that ha you have to have certain impairments then that are functional if it's a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. It doesn't include traumatic brain injuries before the age of 22, which it does in New Hampshire, by the way. So, um, so, so that's covered under a different, <laughs> different program. It actually doesn't cover cerebral palsy if, unless you have an IQ deficit, if you will, an IQ difference that's <laughs> 70 or below, then you might get on the DS waiver. So I like to say that you can have cerebral palsy in New Hampshire, cross the Connecticut River, and all of a sudden you don't have a developmental disability. Now you still have a disability, 
and you might get some services through a different program, Choices for Care, but that menu of, of services is somewhat more limited. So DS is probably the, I wanna, yeah, this is correct, the widest menu, the biggest menu. So for people with a developmental disability, you have to first meet this pretty restrictive definition. That gets you Medicaid, right? And then, then you have to meet what's called a system of care priority. Most states don't use a system of care plan. What they do instead is they say, OK, you, you met criteria. Now you're going to sit on a waiting list for four years, or six years, or eight years. The waiting lists are ridiculous. The state of Washington's waiting list was over 10,000 people. I think Georgia's is too, right? We don't keep a waiting list in Vermont, but that's just because we don't keep one. <laughs> we don't have a waiting list because we don't keep one. <laughs> we have a tiny little waiting list. But instead, what we do is we have this system of care plan, and it sets out certain criteria that narrow and prioritize who can get these waiver packages. And you know, the state's in a really difficult position here. Over the years, right, if you know, they can only use the money that, the, that is appropriated by the legislature. Let's be clear here. Health insurance type of Medicaid, like that's kind of like you have to do that if you buy into the program at all. But waiver is optional. States don't have to do this. So the legislature says, we're going to fund it up to this point. Human services, you figure out how you want to prior prioritize the use of those dollars. So we use this, this system of care plan, right? And we narrow it, and it, it ends up being kind of a lot based on you know, pretty emergency-related um, and crisis-related criteria, because we have to deal with that, right? It's people's health, you know, safety issues often. So the, so the criteria, I won't remember absolutely every category <laughs> without it here. You can find the system of care plan online. But it's typically um, a, um, a threat to health and safety, right? I was actually just yeah, so we'll, we'll try to bring that back next time. So yeah, so you, you know, you're a threat to yourself or others, that's it. Um, you are a parent and you have a developmental disability. Um, you are a youth up to the age of 26 and you have a job. And the, the, the theory there is you might be at risk of losing your job if we don't give you services. Um, Nicole, anybody else remember the other criteria for, for the waiver? Uh, system of care plan priorities. You have to meet one of the system of care plans, like either be homeless, at risk of abuse. At risk of homelessness, at, at risk, risk of, of abuse. abuse. Yep. You have to you know, be a trusted youth to need support to keep a job. Yep. Or those, at risk of institutionalization. Yep. Then so there's a small num one priority with a small amount for parenting. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, so that narrows it down further to a roughly 20 percent. Was that helpful? Yeah. Okay. It, now, it I, looks like Sarah wrote, and maybe we can. And we will find out more because that's not the only. Folks to take down on the break. Yeah, that's not the only waiver program. They, I mean, there's not the only program. Traumatic brain injury, people with mental illness. There are other types of things, but this one comes up a lot because it's the broadest. So okay. First, then just to clarify, that's 20 percent of the people who step forward. That's 20% of the people who step forward and ask to be admitted to the, the, the golden the world of Medicaid because they have a developmental disability. Yeah. Can we get emails linked out to if people would like? Yeah. yeah so it sounds like we're going to get some follow-up information. Yep. Okay. So I think it's break time, right? Yeah, I think we're at break. Um, just a reminder, there's a bathroom around the corner, but if the line gets long, you can take the stairs or the elevator down to the second floor, follow signs. There's another bathroom there. we hit it? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Class is back in session. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody, to um, our workshop on understanding disability and the intersection with wellness. I'm Max Barrows. I'm Outreach Director for Green Mountain Self-Advocates. I've been working for GMSA for nine years, and I am a person with autism, and I'm glad to be here presenting to you all today. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Nicola Blank, Advocacy Director, Green Mountain Self Advocates, also known as the Budget Watchdog. <laughs> Hi, my name's Sky Peeble. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. I work at Green Mountain Self Advocates too as the program director. I'm an ally, which means I don't have a disability, but I support the disability rights movement. Um, and I got involved in self advocacy because my sister, Sterling, uh, has Down syndrome, which is a kind of intellectual or developmental disability. And she and I are pretty much the same age. We're like 13 months apart, so we went to school together at Montpelier. All the schools, like, you know, each grade, we were in the same grade. Um, so I've grown up around issues around disability my whole life, and it's something we've always talked about. And so when I moved back to Vermont a number of years ago, I was lucky enough to get involved with Green Mountain Self Advocates and have just had a really awesome time being part of this great organization. So we're really excited to be here and meet all of you and hear all your thoughts and just bring you into this conversation as partners. So feel free to uh, really participate as much as you want to. We may uh, get up in the audience with you a little bit, so get ready and get cozy. So obviously, as you can see, this is not a grocery store. So we would like to just take this time and just like in this workshop, we want this to be comfortable um, in terms of like a comfortable space. So that way, this is a great chance for you to um, ask whatever you want of us. Um, feel free to ask any questions that come to mind, because this workshop is a great opportunity to do so. And can Max, can I make just another quick reminder? So we, so this is the first time that you'll see us, but we'll be back again in June, and then we're going to do some webinars later this summer. So if you have like a question that's not, it seems like you're asking it, we're like not answering it. It's very possible it's because it's we're going to do a whole workshop on it in June. So we have this parking lot sort of up here. So we're just going to kind of jot down things that come up. So like yesterday, there were a lot of questions specifically about like reasonable accommodations. So we put those in the parking lot because in June, we have some really amazing trainers coming to talk about like the ADA and reasonable accommodations. So just a reminder, so if something comes up that you'd like to make sure we really hit on in the future, just let us know and we'll put it up here. So. So why are we here uh, talking to you about this today? You may be wondering. Um, the purpose of Green Mountain Self Advocates is for people with developmental disabilities to educate peers to take control of their own lives, make decisions, solve problems, and speak for themselves. We educate and make the public aware of our strengths, rights, wants, and needs of people with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, Green Mountain Self Advocates has 21 local groups throughout the state of Vermont with over 600 members who have an intellectual and developmental disability involved. Uh, we help self advocates by letting them say what they believe. And GMSA has been working on projects related to health for a number of years. So just to give you a little bit of an inside scoop on that, uh, we worked with uh, Planned Parenthood to develop the first ever curriculum for self-advocates and staff to teach sexuality education as a team. Uh, we conducted focus groups on the health care experiences of people with developmental disabilities in collaboration with the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and presented with physicians and at national conferences and webinars about this. Um, last year, we co-organized uh, the Vermont Inclusive Healthcare Partnership Project. And we did that along with the Vermont DD Council. And we spent a year working with doctors, nurses, families, and other stakeholders to look at the barriers to the healthcare um, experienced by Vermonters with developmental disabilities and to come up with solutions. And through that, we wrote a final white paper of our findings and would be happy to share with anybody who would like to look at that. So again, we are very happy that you are here today because you are committed to helping people with disabilities partner 
in the healthcare uh, process. So we would like to start this uh, training um, by looking forward to hearing from your ideas and experiences. And because we know that we learn from you as we spend the day together. So we would like to begin um, our training with bringing the voices of people with uh, developmental disabilities uh, to this room. And so what we are going to do is we're going to start out by kind of getting an in-depth look of what impacts us more than our disabilities. And that is the words, attitudes, and actions of others. And a lot of people say that that impacts our lives more than our disabilities. So the way we're going to do that is we are going to pass around a backpack loaded with rocks. And when you get the backpack, take out a rock. And each rock has a comment on it. And the comments that are on the rocks are not, they're not fake. They're actually real read it, and if the words seem too small, ask the person next to you for help. And then after you take out a rock, pass the bag on to the next person. So when you do this, just listen as the quotes on the rock are read. And as that's going on, we will not discuss after every rock quote on the rock is read. And so many of the rocks have stories on them um, from adult members that we have collaborated with and done work with and that are involved. So with that said, you will see a backpack being passed around. And let's begin. What if people talk or write things about you behind your back? I stutter and people just answer for me. I just need time to answer. What would you do if people said you're not allowed to go to a bar? My disability causes my hands to be twisted, but I still want to write things down on paper or handle my own money. I just need extra time to do this, but everyone grabs things from my hands and does it for me. There are times I feel I have to be perfect at everything and that there is no room for error. It's like living in a world where people without disabilities can make mistakes, but people with disabilities cannot. I have my own way of doing things, so why do people tell me to do things their way? What if when you show your emotions or tell people how you feel, you get more meds? Even if an activity is fun, that doesn't mean I want to go do it every day. What if there are team meetings about your life, but you never get to invite who you want to be there? What would you say if people said you could never have children? I was right in the room when everyone was making decisions about my life. They took my kids away because they said I had a disability and I wasn't able to raise them. I have another case manager. They were hired before I even met them. They got to look at my whole life and no one even asked me about this person. I am 43 years old and have never been on a date. I really want to be dating someone. I want to have a boyfriend. What if you made an embarrassing mistake and everybody where you work and live, including your family, knows it? What if you wanted to call your family and were told it had to wait until later? What if you were constantly judged because of something you did in the past? What if you had a disability and you heard people use the word retarded? I want to see my girlfriend on Friday night, but no one will take me. Why do I only get to spend time with her during the week at public places like bingo? 
What if you had to ask people's permission to be alone with someone? I know my support staff has been doing this for 15 years, but that doesn't mean there's nothing more for them to learn. What if one day you had to clean your room before you could go to see a movie? What if people stared at you all the time because of the way you look? People care about me and want to protect me, and I appreciate that, but I don't want to be protected from living my life. I bounced another check. Now my case manager is threatening to take my checkbook away from me. I've made mistakes in the past, it is true, and I've learned some things from my mistakes, but I never get another chance. What if people tried to run your life instead of letting you make choices? What if you were told you could not have pets? What if you got into trouble and were sent away and you couldn't come back because they always remember your trouble? What if someone asked you a question and while you were thinking of your answer, someone decided for you. What if you were told you could never be your own guardian? What if someone said you could not have sex or even hold hands with the person you love? What if you couldn't go outside because the last time you went, it rained? What would you do if people took your things, like your computer, your phone, your iPod, away from you when you make a mistake? I have no privacy now. How will my parents deal with me when they find out that I am gay? What if your money was always kept in an envelope where you couldn't get it? Going into the community poses a tremendous amount of stress on a person with autism. There are so many stimulants. I quietly think to myself, but my sensory system screams out. I want to stop myself, but my autism takes over. Is it weird to quickly flap my hands and say words that have no relevance to any conversation? Yes, it does look very different, but we with autism are not. What if you were 54 years old and were told when you had to go to bed? They told me I could never go to college. Why not? I have dreams too. Another barrier was teachers telling me, if you take the mainstream high school classes, your spirit will be harmed by setting expectations beyond her ability. I am stimulus aware. This makes me need to drown it out. The stimulus that bothers me is light, noise, sounds from the lights, and people in the room. I love people, but they make too much noise. What if you were abused, but you were afraid to tell your caseworker because she did not approve of who you hang out with? Whispering about me, I can hear you, whether, I'm, whether or not I'm able to tell you with words. I love my family, but living at home with them at my age takes a toll on my self-esteem. And the backpack is up back if you would return your rocks to it when you leave for break. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. So sometimes people say that having a disability is a burden. But we encourage people to be proud of who they are, and that includes having a disability. So the real burden is the words, attitudes, and actions of others. And so that is what weighs us down. So imagine every rock with the comment on it being a weight. And it, that backpack, as you take out the rock, it's lessening the weight. But once you put it back in, it's, it's what weighs us down. So it's kind of like the in-depth look, the feel of what people with disabilities face every day. 
So any thoughts on what you heard? Anything that stood out for you? Anything that surprised you? <coughs> Anything you want to comment on in general? Go ahead. Hi. Th Ooh, thank you. Um, what was nice about these rocks is that the message is so clear. Um, many times when I have worked with patients with disabilities, I'm sorry, I'm a nurse, so sometimes I'll say patients, but individuals with disabilities, um, getting that clear communication back, either because of um, speech problems or the way the message is worded, um, I may not be getting the message that this individual wants to portray. And any automated devices that you find may help, um, I'd be interested to know. I'm familiar with Pascal Chain's work at the Howard Center, who uses um, a computer technology for members who cannot um, speak. And you speak very clearly. And so it's just any hints that you have or tools for any communication facility by an automated device, be it a cell phone or a special tablet, um, I'd be interested to know about. Thank you. I'm going to put that just in the parking lot to make sure when we, in June we have a whole communication unit to talk about techni technology to assist with communication. Does that cover with that? that Go ahead. Um, I don't know if I would make that do. So what I just heard is a lot of, um, it sounds like the workers that they've been working with are not functioning from a strengths-based approach, and they're not focusing on what their needs are and what their wants are. And I think that that's a problem, because we often think, oh, we know what's best for them, and we know what's going to work for them. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we have to continuously ask them what their needs are, just as people. Comments. As Max said, thank you for your comments and for reading those out loud. Um, can you turn your mic up barely individually? Yes, uh, or I can just use it better. How about that? Great, okay, cool. I'm actually going to unhook it because I'm feeling stifled. Oh, no, no. I think if I just, I'm just going to hold it. I'm happy to hold it. Thank okay. you. Does this work? Yes. Cool. So as Max said at the beginning, and I'm Sky again, like, so we're really happy you're here because we. this is a partnership. So we're here because we have some ideas and some tools and strategies that we'd like to dis, you know, present and sort of have a conversation with you about. And you're the ones who go out every day and do this enormous amount of work and just have this fabulous influence in your communities and in your jobs and then in your personal lives. So we're just excited to have you here as our partners and um, look forward to hearing about all the ideas and things that you have to say. But to get an idea of who's in the room, because right now you're all uh, kind of anonymous. So who's here as a nurse? Can you raise your hand? Oh, we have a lot of nurses. Awesome. Uh, is anyone here um, like an MD or a PA or an NP? Okay, great. One? Okay, awesome. Uh, anyone here from housing, from SASH? Whoa! Let's hear it for SASH. Good, right? That's awesome. Um, anyone here a case manager or a care coordinator? Okay, another, wow. Anyone raising their hand twice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, anyone here from developmental services? Yeah, woohoo. Uh, anyone here from the mental health side of things? Cool, awesome. Um, who am I missing? Anyone here an educator? I mean, you're all educators in your own right. Hi, cool, wonderful. Um, anyone that I didn't mention? Blueprint? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, great, wonderful. And um, substance abuse. Oh, substance abuse, great. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't 
mean to omit that. I'm just running through the list in my head. Wonderful. And does anyone here have a family member with a disability? Fabulous. Uh, anyone have like a friend or a neighbor or someone else in their life that isn't a family member with a disability? So pretty much everyone. That's fabulous. Well, we're really excited to hear all the thoughts that you have. So welcome. And again, feel free to get up and move, get water, use the restrooms. We're very flexible. So just want to make you comfortable for the next little bit. I'll hand it to Nicole to talk about your learning goals for today. If you want to refer to the list of learning goals in your folder, you will be looking for this list. By the end of this workshop, our goal is for you to be able to, one, demonstrate basic knowledge of what disability is and how our understanding of disability has changed over time. Two, identify the unique personal and cultural barriers people with disabilities face when accessing health care. Three, embrace the need for and promote strategies such as self-determination, dignity of risk. Four, know where you can access more resources on this topic. We'll take some time at the end of the day for your feedback on how well we've done at meeting these goals. Thanks, Nicole. So Kirsten did a great job of introducing you to the social determinants of health. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's actually a great place to come in, this being your first day of training, because you're kind of like a brimming with ideas and like a fresh slate. So we're really looking forward to brainstorming a little bit. But wellness is something I just want to touch on quickly. And I know it's hard to read, but up there it's sort of a heart shape and it has a lot of different words inside of it. So I think what helps for a lot of people is not thinking about wellness it helps to think about what wellness isn't to begin with. So wellness is not just eliminating sickness, and it's definitely not the absence of disability. Like, I kind of like to think of wellness as being a pie, or like anything that goes into like a bowl. It's a combination of things. It's, a po it's positive health that is made up of a lot of different things. So pie is the positive health in this example. I'm a big baker and a big consumer of baked goods. So I think that's kind of a useful analogy for me. So in that pie of positive health, you have your physical health, but you also have your emotional health, you have your mental health, you have your social health, your spiritual health, your vocational health, a lot of the things that Kirsten started to talk a little bit about. So wellness looks really different for everyone. So if I were to poll everyone in this room, I will not, don't worry, but we'd have like a long list probably of things that contribute to that pie, sort of that one week a year maybe where we all feel like all of our wellness components are coming together in that sort of perfect fruition that turns, and you feel fulfilled. You feel like this, um, like this fullness of wellness, I like to call it. So for me, wellness looks like, like I get to spend time with my dog in the woods. Uh, I get to have dinner with my husband and we don't watch like movies the entire time. Like we talk and say like, how was your day? It was great, thanks. Um, it's like getting to go for a run, like eating the foods that I want and feeling really successful at my job and like really loving working with my coworkers. There's like all these pieces when they come together, I have this sort of overwhelming sense of all this like positive health because all these pieces are contributing. So I, I'd love to hear what other people in this room think contribute to their wellness. So just, I can probably keep up, but just shout them out. Um, and I'll repeat them so we don't have to pass the microphone around. But um, what, what makes you feel a sense of wellness? Being outdoors. Being outdoors, awesome. It's quiet time. Awesome, quiet time, being outdoors. Having balance. Balance, tell me more about balance. Pardon? Tell me more about balance. Just trying to put different things in perspective and keeping your priorities as to what's important. Yeah. Keeping your priorities to what is important to you. Awesome. What else? Getting exercise. Exercise, yes. Creativity. Yes. Awesome. Creativity. Breaky. Baking? Reiki. Reiki. Family. Family. Definitely. Being appreciated. Mm. Yeah. Being appreciated. Not letting negative people affect me. Not letting negative people affect you. Did I hear movement too? So not letting negative 
people affect me. I promise you, these are letters, and I will read this, so. Laughter. Okay. Reflection on, on self. Take a minute every day to figure out, like, you could have been kinder or whatever about yourself. That's really Reflection. wonderful. Yeah. Reflection on self. Fresh air. Fresh air. Money to spend. Yes. <laughs> Pets. 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 That's awesome. Chocolate. Chocolate does help. We have a lot of it here in the room today, so make sure you get your full. Gratitude. Did I hear something say sleep? Yeah. Yes. That's huge. Freedom. Sleep. Freedom. Gratitude. Gratitude. Thank you. Water. Water. Economic security. Music. I heard job security. I heard music. Novel opportunities. Novel opportunities. That's a great one. Deep breathing. Deep breathing. Yeah. Safety. Safety. That's really important. Who said that? Awesome. Hi. Behind the camera. Cool. Thank you. And I'm sorry we're not going to get to learn everyone's name, but if you want to say your name when you say something, feel free to, so we can connect on that too. Flexibility. Uh -huh. Flexibility. Good attitude. Yes. Housing. Housing. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Spirituality. Spirituality. Great. Friends. Food. Friends, and I heard good food. Like your idea of good food or other people's idea of good food? My idea. Yeah. My idea. Reading a good book. I heard reading a good book, and I also heard traveling. Yeah. A couple more? Appreciating sights and sounds of nature. Appreciating sights and sounds of nature, and then hobbies. So what I'll end up doing with these, hobbies. I'm going to have to quickly go translate this, because I sort of got a little scribbly. So what I'll do with these is uh, I'm going to add these to this heart. These are actually things that other um, components of people from the Brattleboro Montpelier trainings have added to this sort of heart, so I'm just going to kind of keep adding to it, and then I don't know what will happen with it, but perhaps someday it will float its way into your inbox. But um, thank you for that. And I mean, one of the things that's great about wellness is that it's not the same for anyone, so nobody here is going to have the same list. Um, and as care coordinators, care managers, and all your different jobs, you're not going to be able to sort of put all of your um, pieces together and find the same solution for every one person towards like achieving their set of wellness, which is great, right? That's sort of the amazing thing about being human. Everyone's different. That's really cool. But it makes your jobs a little bit more challenging. So one of the things that we're going to do today is hopefully talk about some tools and strategies that um, will work for everybody no matter who they are. So they're tools that are applicable. And although we're talking about people with disabilities specifically, we think that these are tools that are actually really pretty useful for working with anyone, no matter who they are. So uh, just wanted to point that out. So these are strategies that will hopefully work for 10 out of 10 people that you see in your life. And actually, we'll skip this because Kirsten did a great job. All righty, so one of the first things uh, we want to talk about today is uh, the language that we use. And language is very powerful because it can either do two things. It can have a, you know, it could build people up or have the opposite effect of tearing people down. So my question to you all is, raise your hand if you've heard of people or person first language. practically all of you. And can you just quickly give me an example of what you've heard in that regard? A person who is gay. Yeah. 
What makes that person first? Um, it's a, the word person in front of the, the descriptor or the label. Any others? I had a friend working at an agency in Massachusetts 25 years ago who got a memo that said we'll now count, we will now call our clients people. Kind of ironic and strange. So, but they actually sent a memo and said we'll now call them people. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. All right, so I guess, go ahead. Um, often I hear people call an individual who struggles with substance abuse uh, as an addict, um, and we have moved away from that and now just talk about them as a person who struggles with an opioid use disorder. Okay. Good to point out, go ahead. Addict, it almost implies that that's all that that person is. But when you say a person with addiction, they're also a you know maybe a person with a family and a person with a job and a person with their that's one part of who they are, not all of who they are. Yeah. Great comment. Go ahead. I think it's the same with if you have a mental health issue as well. Like you'll hear people refer to as schizophrenic, but they're actually a person who has schizophrenia. You say older adults instead of. Yeah. I'm just amazed by hearing this because I have some examples of that actually and all of your um, answers are really good um, and just to pick up on that you are right that person first language is the concept of putting the person before the disability or whatever it is and this is important when we are talking about people or two people with uh, disabilities. And so you guys came up with really good examples. But to add to that, I have a few that I would like to share uh, myself that I came up with. So say person with an intellectual or developmental disability instead of mentally retarded. Um, as one of my peers says, when, I, when we hear the word retarded or retard, it makes us want to curl up in a ball and die. Actually, it's hide. Or hide. Um, say she doesn't speak or is nonverbal instead of she is mute or they are mute. Say he has or is a person with, instead of saying suffers from something. Say, quote, uses a wheelchair or mobility device instead of saying wheelchair bound. Wheelchairs allow people um, and our ability to move and get around and about. Um, for adults, s developmental disabilities, you should say, instead of developmentally delayed. Um, say she struggles with or they struggle with mental health instead of saying they have a mental health disorder. Some people feel that it's negative when they hear the word disorder because the word disorder itself can sound like, well, you if you can't get things in order or you have trouble with organizing, then you are just someone who cannot organize at all or you just you function in a way that's not, you know, to a certain standard. Um, say, quote, they struggle with the disease or addiction, an example was you know, shared earlier, or they have an addiction instead of addicts. So that was clearly shared. Okay. 
if someone is part of the deaf community and is deaf, say that they are deaf. Um, and if someone has you know, mild or moderate hearing loss, say hard of hearing, and these words are preferred over hearing impaired, and avoid using the word the before a group of people such as the blind or the deaf because instead say people who are blind because when you imply the word the before you know a group of people it makes it sound like they're like a separate species so you know the this the that instead say this or blind or a person who's deaf um, so the other thing I would like to mention is, you know, this is pretty common for people with autism. We feel it would be better just saying someone who is on the autism spectrum or has autism or someone who has, you know, with autism. A lot of times, a lot of people use the term high and low functioning. And that can be hurtful because the term itself brings out the message that people with autism of all different forms are divided. So people that have mild forms of autism are known to be better than people that have you know, more moderate or significant forms of autism. So the term high-low functioning brings that negative message out. And it also is the case for all disabilities, not just autism. So it would be better off if that was not used. Instead, just say someone on the autism spectrum, because then you're s describing somebody with autism as like the whole spectrum. And no matter where they are on the spectrum, you're saying that they have their own you know, strengths. Um, the other thing I would like to point out is, you know, a lot of you are doc, well, nurses and work um, all kinds of jobs, but the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual does not recognize the term Asperger's anymore, which was the claimed term for the so-called high-functioning autism. Um, instead, they have said autism spectrum disorder. So just to point that out as we talk about language. so. Are there any other questions uh, on these before I move on? I know I just talked at you, but I mean, have, do you have any thoughts or observations you want to share? Go ahead. I just find it interesting in professional circles when we're all around a table, we'll often use the quick label language, and I, I, find, it, I find it painful sometimes. Um, and I kind of understand it. Um, but I, I think when we're talking to each other, uh, putting the person first language is really important. Great. Can I make a quick comment to that? Go ahead. Actually, so, so a couple of other people in previous trainings have, have touched on that topic. And a woman said in Brattleboro, this, she said, you know, the thing is, is that I need to use the same language that everyone else in my office uses, because that's how we communicate. You know, it's like an office culture. Like, so I can't use a word that other people aren't using. Like, they have to be able to understand what I'm talking about. So it brought up this, and as you're saying, there's this great opportunity for culture shift. So sort of as you're here at this training, I mean, it's this great opportunity to make that culture shift so that everyone is speaking about the same thing, using the same words, if that makes sense. There's a lot of shorthands, so just figuring out how to make that substitution and sort of that ripple effect. But it's a great comment. Go ahead. Did everyone hear that? No. Could you repeat that? Can you repeat that again? I have no idea. Are there some mics up there? I'm from Vermont Family Network. We support families at education meetings, and a lot of times working with educators or other people, and this is not to criticize them, but it's like quick shorthand. People will say the free and reduced lunch kids, 
the poor families, you know, and it's just, I keep going back to this as well, people first. It's not everything about the person. I'm sorry. Um, just to follow up on what was happening here, there's the difference between the clinical language and people language. So yeah, sometimes a bunch of medical people get together and they can talk medical, but when they come and talk to the patient, the doctor has to change that language and talk a different language. But this is a different thing. I can understand how sometimes we're talking the clinical, but yeah, when we're talking about people, it's gotta be that people first language. And I mean, we've gone all the way through it with race, immigration, sex, men and women, how we use language around each other. It's the same thing with disability. You have to make that cultural shift. And sometimes you have to be the one to make it happen. So why is it important to use um, respectful language when you talk about people with disabilities or anybody in that matter? fosters an atmosphere of equality, to repeat. Yeah. Go ahead. And I think it'll be interesting if we can come up with a different word in the future, not disabled. He's just learning about it and learning that he has a disability. And he said to me this morning, well, I don't think I have a disability. What's wrong with these people? The can word disabled, the I hate. Also, I can't hear you. Can you hold the mic no, I'm all, I'm all set, thanks. <laughs> it wasn't hurting, it's well, it's on my fault I didn't have it turned on. Yeah, um, so can I, do you want me to try to paraphrase? Sure, what's your name? Angie. So Angie's saying she has a, a child with a disability and that he's starting to learn about his disability and he's sort of saying like, well, I don't have a disability. That's not something that like he identifies with and that like you struggle with the word disabled mm -hmm. and hope that in the future there can be an alternative word. Right. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about identity first language, Max? Because that, that is something, so in the whole sort of world of people with disabilities, there's a lot of different opinions yeah. about language. And as Kirsten said, not everybody agrees. Right. And I think, you know, identity first versus person first language, I've run into many, you know, debates about this. But um, it is tricky because the idea of person first language that we strongly encourage is, and of course, like a lot of you said, it's less judgmental in their people. You're putting the person first. Um, and a lot of people believe that if they put the disability first, you know, it's the concept of that's all they are, that's all who they are. But it's also respecting how that person or whoever you're talking about, you know, wants to be identified. Because they may want, they, I mean, there will be people that you will, you know, encounter or probably have encountered already that don't use person first language and they refer to themselves as a disabled person or an autistic person. And they are comfortable with using language that they identify by putting their disability first than themselves as a person. I think what if it comes down to is, you know, asking the person that you're interacting with how do you want to be preferred to as? It can be tricky, but that's what it comes down to um, because you don't want to disrespect how that person pers likes to be referred to and how they identify themselves with also in keeping in mind that you don't want people to think that they're just what their disability is. It's a very tricky um, position, um, and there is a lot of debate about it, but it does come down to what the person ref you know, likes to be referred to. Paul, well, do you want to add anything? 
Yes, uh, the issue of identity for sight is a tricky thing. And also, if we look at, you often hear people that are culturally deaf, they don't consider themselves disabled. With a capital D. With so. a capital D. So. And as you were talking about your uh, child not considering that they have a disability, it's like, like, that's definitely interesting. It's like, it's like, I wanted to think years from now, people will use the term differently abled. Because what you're getting at is that, you know, the word disabled implies unable. What's attached to that word? No, just, just very quickly. Um, somebody have a question? I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'm just curious, getting back to the language part that you were talking about, whether there are any studies or any, any um, tracing in the, like, the historical changes in the language over, like say, the last 100 years years or 150 years has anyone ever looked at that like how the language has changed during that time period to show where we were and where we're at and where we want to move towards well Related there's to the videos that have if you see videos of closing institutions like lost in laconia which is a new hampshire institution that closed in 91 they said the school for the feeble-minded definitely shows the language they used what about the respectful language? This would be and Vermont also uh, got a respectful language bill passed a few years ago. We went through all the statutes, came up with all the words to eliminate as advocates. Statutes in what? In state law. What Nicole is describing is... Words like moron, idiot. Uh-huh, MR, insane. There's a lot of things that have to be changed, especially at a federal level, even though we have Rose's Law, which eliminated the R word. But I'd put that in the parking lot just because I think it would be interesting to see if there is like a timeline out there. And if there is, then we can bring it in in June or attach it to the very long email of resources you're going to get after this training. Good question. So with all that in your heads now, we are going to do a couple of activities to check out respectful in-person first language in the world around us. So we are using handout number one, um, as in your you know, folders. And what I would like you to do is turn to the person um, you are sitting near or next to you, and you will have five minutes for the first activity. Use your phone to go on Google and to find stories um, about people with disabilities and notice whether or not they use uh, respectful or person-first language. And then when we tell you that to move to activity number two, you will have another five minutes to think about your place where you work, like your office job or wherever, mm -hmm. uh, and whether or not they use um, respectful or person-first language. At five minutes, and then after five minutes is up, you'll hear another ding, and then you go to a new activity, and you'll have another five minutes. Does that make sense? Yes.
the big award the other day. Yeah, CAX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great article. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's quiet. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Max. So let me ask you, what have you found? If you want to share any examples or things that you would, oh, go ahead. Did, wow, okay. You want to go first? Go ahead. I found something interesting. I looked up um, wheelchair sports federations. Uh -huh. And in their first paragraph, they, they um, spoke of themselves as providing opportunities for the disabled, which uh -huh. I didn't find particularly person-centered or people first, but then they redeemed themselves because in the next paragraph they were talking about a coach who works in adaptive sports, and I thought that was quite a respectful term. It's a positive term to me. Anybody? Uh, go ahead. Um, I just found a headline that said blind athlete wins race or something like that. And, and it's just, it's especially, I think, important um, with headlines because that's often the only thing that people read and it makes a big impact. And obviously, I mean, the fact that you're an accomplished athlete, that's quite an accomplishment. And the fact that it's the person that is visually impaired or is blind is, um, frankly, secondary. I found a headline that said wheelchair bound couple in Florida upset over receipt and their receipt was identified at the bottom of the receipt um, the chair so that's how they were pointing out who to give the check to I'm the parent of an adult uh, daughter with disabilities when she was young, around four years old, we had two reporters that came to talk to us about her disability. One reporter had 26 years of experience of writing articles about people with disabilities. The other one was brand new, two weeks. And then the articles came out. Remember, they heard the same thing. And if you Google my daughter's name, the first thing that comes up is doomed. And the guy who was the one that had done it all his life, like 26 years, wrote an article and the title of it was girl is doomed. I've never even used that word to describe my daughter. And the other guy wrote an article that said um, parents are seeking answers to a puzzle because she was a puzzle at the time. Uh, she does have um, Rett syndrome. But um, anyway, I just wanted to say it was an eye opener for me being a young parent, how somebody could perceive that conversation to use the word doomed. I mean, we never thought of our daughter as doomed. And to this day, she's 34 years old. You Google her name, and the first thing that comes up is the word doomed. So it can have a lifelong, uh, this language can follow people forever. And I, I just had to say that for me as a parent, it, it changed my life. And I learned a lot of things to help other parents when they deal with the media or anything like that. But um, it was sad. It was a sad lesson. And, and uh, what you're getting at, the, a good example of how, you know, what's said as a kid can also lead to low expectation syndrome as you get older. Were there any out of it? I went to Facebook instead. Uh, my husband has a neurological um, disability, and uh, at one point he joined a group on Facebook related to his medical condition, and um, he told me he unjoined the group, but he didn't really say why. And I'm not sure that he pays a lot of attention to the language per se, but the first thing that stuck out in my mind, it says, my fellow ataxians, and it sounds to me like aliens or... Um, <laughs> So um, that just struck me as um, people within the group 
referring to themselves maybe in a way that might be offensive to other people. I think it was to him. What about exercise? Oh, go ahead. Did you have your hand up? The, um, the one thing I did is I had Googled the people first language, and one of the articles that's kind of, that caught my eye was um, by a Kathy Snow, and it's called People First Language, and it said, um, Inclusion, let's see, to ensure inclusion, freedom, and respect for all, it's time to embrace the um, people first language. And she's got right in the center of the article, my phone will cooperate here, um, a quote from Mark Twain, and it says, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. And I think that um, in terms of um, when we speak of people who are just a little bit different than we are, we need to always be respectful and mindful of that. What about activity number two? What about your workplace? Go. A lot of us in here work for housers, and people that take applications have check boxes and lines of finance, and that spreads into the culture where people are categorized um, by their poverty or disability or their age. Um, and so the language around in, in my office, not necessarily disrespectful, but again, the culture of speaking in labels for ease um, is pretty prevalent. <clears throat> and I, I found myself using it myself, um, you know, subsidized versus, you know, um, open uh, free market pricing and all that kind of stuff. So I found myself um, thinking about like when I'm working with a client specifically, I try, I really am conscious about the language that I use, but then um, I notice like behind closed doors or when you're in the office and no client is repre like representation of themselves, I think that the language kind of shifts a little bit. Um, and I feel like I'm guilty of that myself, uh, just kind of venting about certain activities that could have happened, but. I could be more mindful behind closed doors and just, I don't know. Just to kind of piggyback off of what you said is, um, you know, working at a, a, a methadone clinic, there's stigma already attached to it. Um, and we work a lot with corrections. And um, one of the things that I've been struggling with is uh, a lot of our, the people that we work with are coming out of corrections or coming from incarceration. And <laughs> so we en end up um, referring to people as offenders or inmates or when we're working with probation officers. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a sort of like a systemic issue that is uh, sort of just ingrained in the way that we work and um, part of our culture and we use it on a daily basis and we have to be mindful of what our own personal biases are and um, I think that's where I, at least where I'm understanding the shift to, that needs to happen needs to happen at. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing that. We got a break for lunch. Um, so, on that note, um, we are going to break for lunch and until one o'clock. Mm -hmm.
though, and we will get started with you know our training when we get back. So have a good lunch and see you back here at one o'clock. Welcome back. How was your break, guys and gals? Good. Now we're going to talk about myths and attitudes. Much like many groups of people, there are lots of myths out there about people with disabilities. A myth is defined as a false belief about something or someone. They are common throughout our society and impact us every day. It is my hope that as professionals in the healthcare field, you will join us as allies in helping to bust these myths about people with disabilities. Now we're gonna do an activity, true-false quiz, to explore some myths and attitudes. In your folders, you will find a pink sheet of paper and a green sheet of paper. You're going to read some statements about people with disabilities. If you agree with the statement, raise your green paper. If you disagree with the statement, raise your pink paper. People who are nonverbal can communicate, true or false. Correct, though. The answer is true. There are lots of ways for people to communicate. Some people type or use communication devices. Some people use their eyes. Some use sign language. People with disabilities can't take care of themselves. True or false? Nice. The answer is false. We live up to the bar other people set for us. People with disabilities can learn to take care of themselves. They may need support for this. Next one, people with disabilities can give consent. True or false? Good. People, the answer is true. People with disabilities have the right to make their own decisions. Even people who have guardians can still give their consent to participate in activities medical procedures, and other important life decisions. People with disabilities can and do work, true or false? Good answer. <laughs> the answer is true. We are at work right now, as are many of our colleagues with disabilities around the world. However, there are lots of barriers to employment for people with disabilities that need to be fixed in our society. Next one, every disability is different, true or false? Good, the answer is true. We always say when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Each individual's experience of their disability is unique to that person and their care must be approached differently based on the individual's specific strengths, values, preferences, and needs. Support slash service animals wear a vest and are registered, true or false? Service Support slash service animals wear a vest and are registered, true or false? Well, the answer is false. There is no certification required in Vermont. You can ask if the dog is trained to do a specific task to assist someone with a disability, but that's all you can ask. Next one, people with disabilities are sexual beings, true or false? Good, the answer is true. People with disabilities are like everyone else. They want to be in loving, consensual, s respectful, safe relationships. You can always tell when someone has a disability, true or false? These are some examples of myths and attitudes that affect us in our daily lives. There are two important take home messages. One, we are people first and we have the same hopes and desires as people without disabilities. Two, when given the right support, a person with a disability can achieve the same goals and dreams as someone without a disability. We just need support. 
Why do you think it's important to understand how missing attitudes affect people with disabilities? Why do you think it's important to understand how missing attitudes affect people with disabilities? Don't be shy. Anybody else? Can I make a quick comment? Sure. I mean, I would argue too, or just say that, so you guys are in these wonderful positions as allies, where you, and since you've also been sort of part of this training, you're gonna continue to be part of this training, you're in these great positions to bust myths in your offices and in like your communities, in sort of a way, because it may not always be black and white, like it may not always be like you saying true or false when a myth comes up, but there might be these sort of more subtle moments where you have an opportunity um, to sort of say, oh, well actually, have you thought about this? Or there might be these great opportunities for you to step up and bust these myths in a little bit less specific of ways. So I would say that you're also, by being aware of them, it puts you in a really great position to speak to them when they come up. Thanks for participating. As a healthcare professional, we are excited you are joining us in helping to bust these myths about people with disabilities. Next is the models of disability. It is important for healthcare professionals to learn how the history and how viewpoints of disability have changed over time. Disability has ranged from being something that was looked at as bad to being another part of human diversity that makes this world so wonderful. There have been several views of disability that we will share. The first one is the medical model of disability. This model says disability is a medical problem in the body that needs to be fixed. People with disabilities are seen as broken. This model sees the doctor as expert in medicine and technology are the cure. An example of the impact of the medical model was the building of large institutions. People with disabilities were sent there with the idea of being cured. Instead, they became places where anyone with a disability would get locked up to prevent them from having kids or passing on their genetic traits. The second model of disability is the oldest one of all and is known as the belief or moral model of disability. The moral or belief-based model of disability says, disability is either a blessing, a curse, or a marked difference or moral weakness, sometimes a threat to the community. We are either saints or sinners. Like sometimes, for instance, you'll hear, oh, because Sky works with people with disabilities, she's so special, she's gonna go to heaven. One example we often use. The third model is the World Health Organization or social definition of disability. This says that disability is not something that a person has. Instead, you need to think about their surroundings. A person is more or less disabled based on their interactions within the environment. A person might have difficulty seeing, speaking, or hearing but making some changes to the environment can decrease their level of disability. Social viewpoint of disability is a civil rights approach that rejects the notion that disability is a medical problem. Social viewpoint says that society is the one that needs to change. Society is the thing that is broken and need to be fixed. Disability is also viewed as a natural part of the human experience, so the real disability is society's attitudes. As we say at GMSA, your words and actions impact me more than my disability. What I like about this model is that disability is seen as a positive part of human diversity.
please raise your hand if you have heard of the eugenics movement. Eugenics is defined as a set of beliefs and practices that aims at improving the genetic quality of the human population. It might surprise you that there is a history of eugenics here in Vermont. In 1931, the governor of Vermont signed a law called a law for human betterment by voluntary sterilization. The goal of the law was to reduce poverty and cut the cost of government services by preventing certain people from having kids that the state might have to take care of. The bill, the people targeted in this bill were the Abenaki and people with French Canadian backgrounds, poor people, and lastly, people with disabilities. The law said that people would volunteer to be sterilized, but this is not what happened. For example, people in Brandon Training School, which is an institution that closed in 93, were not allowed to leave unless they were sterilized. They still don't know the total number of people sterilized because of this law. The law was finally overturned in 1980. This is an example from close to home of how the medical and moral model of disability has negatively impacted people with disabilities. The bottom line to remember is that the medical and moral model sees people with disabilities as different and apart from other people. When people with disabilities are set apart from others, that is when they are vulnerable to abuse, mistreatment, exploitation. There is a ripple effect of how they are treated. These are not just history lessons. As professionals in the health and social services field, you are our partners, and we want you to understand how this history has shaped people's experiences so you can help us make positive change in our culture. So thank you so much. I hope you all had a good lunch. Did you guys have a good lunch? Yeah. OK. I want to start out by asking uh, you guys as an audience, what kinds of things do you value? What do you value? Relaxation. Having choices. Having choices. Okay. Integrity. Integrity. Honesty. Honesty. Memories. Independence. Financial independence. Community. Friendships. Feeling productive. Productive. Driver's license. Driver's license. <laughs> That's a great one. My faith-based community. Ability to read. Ability to read if people didn't hear. You should always value yourself. 
value yourself. So, there are many people with disabilities in this world, and they are all part of a different communities and cultures. We want to we want to briefly talk to you about some of the values of the disability community. And these are written in the Developmental Disabilities Act and are held by many people with disabilities and are strongly supported by Green Mountain self-advocates. We want to encourage you to keep these in mind when you work around people um, and you're around people in your jobs uh, with disabilities and also just in your life. <clears throat> so disability is a natural and normal part of the human experience. Um, we want to have control and informed uh, choice over lives. Everyone has the ability to make decisions when given the proper support. We want to fully participate in and contribute to our communities. We believe in full in integration and inclusion an individualized manner. We believe services should be provided individually in the community instead of in separate settings. Everyone has the right to live meaningful and productive lives. As people with disabilities, we want to be seen for the many strengths and contributions that we bring to the heart of our communities. We want friendships and relationships that are felt by both parties we should live free in, of abuse, neglect, as well as financial and sexual exploitation. People should presume competence, which means not assuming someone can or cannot do anything based on their disability. Nothing about us without us. This means that we are at the table when decisions are being made that directly impact our lives. The slogan originally came from South Africa during the time of the apartheid, but um, it was over time the disability uh, community chose to embrace it. And people with disabilities are experts in their own lives. It is important that we are really listened to 100%. We need to be taken seriously and not used as tokens. And people with disabilities require the same quality of medical service and preventative care as individuals without disabilities. So the next slide, as you, you will see, um, the next few slides will go over some ideas and strategies that we think are essential parts of the conversation about you know, disability and wellness. And first, we want to explain the concept of self-advocacy and self-determination. Self-advocacy is uh, defined in two ways. It is the civil rights movement for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And as an individual who wants to learn the skills to speak up for themselves and others, as well as take responsibility for their own actions. Self-advocacy helps find the voice, self-advocacy helps people find their voice and use it. And the goal is of the self-advocacy movement is uh, to reduce social isolation and give us the skills we need to take control of our lives. Self-advocacy and self-determination go hand in hand. Self-determination is the act of having control over one's life and resources. Self-determination has many benefits. For instance, it makes sense that people with disabilities will be more committed to health and wellness decisions if they are in the driver's seat. So it is important to, for health professionals to know and to value the concept of self-determination because it plays a big role in being and building partnerships instead of barriers. 
Um, Max, I'm wondering if I can just ask you if you can tell us about a time, just like one sort of example you can think of how self-advocacy has made a difference in your life. Um, well, self-advocacy has made a difference in my life, and I can I'll answer this in two ways. Um, first one is on a personal level. Um, for me, it has helped made a change in my life by being proud of the person I am, and that includes having autism. And the way that it worked was um, just meeting people that had um, all kinds of disabilities and them learning from me and me learning from them and eventually connecting with them and building relationships with the people that I still do to this day with the job that I do. Um, and just through that, it has given me like the strengths um, of just taking pride of like who I am as a person and not being as intimidated to really like say that I have a disability, I'm not afraid of, you know, telling people that I have a disability and like just being proud of that. Um, and on a professional level, it's helped, it helps me still to this day um, become a better leader. When I meet people with um, disabilities um, throughout the state, throughout my community, and even like throughout the country, and hopefully my goal is around the world, it builds that leadership in me where I, from learning and listening to people with disabilities, I take that and I speak up for what is needed to be done to make a difference in the lives of the people that I work around and for and take a stand against anything that is discriminatory and really bring the voices of people to the table whenever decisions are made about their lives, like I said earlier. Um, it's just overall the connecting with people that I work with throughout um, the state of Vermont and even in the country as well as my community. And I define this as the peer-to-peer -peer connection. And through the work I do, what I have noticed, not only with myself, but with um, people that I have met, connecting with peers has changed the lives of people who join self-advocacy in many ways. But to be quick, just to give a few examples, you know, people rely on advice um, when they want to take on challenges that they face. But sometimes they use other resources, like they go to other people. And I'm not saying that, you know, people that they go to, everyone is that bad. But what I've gotten was sometimes the information they get from people that are not peers can be too sugar-coated or biased, may feel a little too controlling. As for with people with disabilities, you know, they, they learn through experience that, you know, it's okay to, you know, talk about your disability and whenever given advice, they're given like the honest truth from another peer that has experienced any kind of challenges that um, they face or they have faced while growing up uh, with a disability. Um, so that's one thing and quickly the other thing is <clears throat> People with disabilities that I have met have said that self-advocacy is therapeutic. A lot of people with disabilities, when they connect with each other, um, they basically come in and their life has changed in ways that are just unbelievable. Like some people come in and they have had a history of doing harm to themselves. like cutting themselves because they're so depressed. And they go to licensed therapy, even though I'm not saying that's bad. It's a good idea to get help uh, for that. But just connecting with other peers within self-advocacy has gone beyond that in terms of really, you know, understanding from other people 
and given like the strength of just being feeling good about yourself has put that energy in them where it's made that change in their life that licensed therapy doesn't quite do. And just quickly, the third thing is, you know, people realize that they're not alone. They're not the only person who is different that has faced, you know, challenges coming over obstacles. They learn from other people that they're not alone and it just overall gives them the strengths that they need to speak up for themselves, some of which they have not um, been aware of uh, when they were younger. And also it's just given them the pride to be themselves and just, you know, it's a continuing thing where, you know, they now use that strength to, uh, you know, to uh, help others that join self-advocacy. So it's a nonstop continuation of all this. So yes, definitely it does change the life of people um, in many ways, connecting with peers. So next, uh, when working with people with disabilities, and really all people, um, we think it's incredibly important to always remember to presume competence. And to presume competence, it means to believe that all people with disabilities have abilities. And it means not to look at someone and prejudge them on what they can and cannot do uh, based off their disability. And it is about having high expectations and dreams for us. Most people with disabilities perform better when expected, um, when others expect them to do well. And expectations are a motivating factor in whether or not you know, people with disabilities uh, succeed. So presuming competence will go a long way toward improving communication and building trust. And what I mean by that is uh, when we talk uh, to people with this, uh, about presuming competence, you know, what it does is it's about our health and concerns. We want to feel listened to and validated. And later today, speaking of that, you will hear from the Vermont Family Network about uh, person-centered planning. And this is a process that has tons of opportunities to presume competence. And just quickly, here are some additional tips for you in supporting your healthcare team and coworkers to presume competence. So number one, don't talk about someone as if they were not there. Number two, learn to adapt to people's communication styles. We'll, take a lot about, we'll talk a lot more about that in June. Um, but this is something we all need to remind my, ourselves about, me and myself included. Um, support people to make use of their strengths because everybody has them. And have a can-do attitude. Ask yourself, how can this work? And presume competence in yourself. Sometimes you might be in an uncomfortable situation and you don't know what to do next, but stick with it. It will be, and just be a little creative when you do so, and really believe in yourself and believe that you can do this. Oh, uh, I'm wondering if you would share a time or an example when someone has presumed confidence in you or not presumed confidence and it's made a difference in your life. Good question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, one example I have recently this year, uh, for several years I've had the diagnosis of epilepsy and after get, getting a normal MRI, normal outpatient EEG and having been, been on so many meds that didn't work, back in January I asked my neurologist, is there anything else there that causes seizures and is there anything else there other than just meds to treat? Because it seems like the meds weren't really working and as a result of that we he ordered a video EEG 
which is where you spend a week in the hospital off epilepsy meds and they a camera watches you and sees so they see what it's like when you have a seizure and as a result of doing that the results of that test were <laughs> my seizures aren't epileptic they're psychogenic non-epileptic seizures and I'm now been off meds for almost going on a month. So your healthcare provider, so you said, you asked them to have a conversation with you and include you as sort of a partner and they presumed that you knew your body and listened to your body and felt like that was a successful uh -huh, And he asked like, how long, is it, how long have you known that you've had epilepsy? Said, All I know from my parents' records that I read that are tucked away. Thanks, Nicole. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, being an ally. And an ally is someone who supports and champions a cause or a movement. So what I would like you guys to do is you have two minutes and turn to a partner uh, and come up with a list of ways to be an ally to people with disabilities in the jobs that you do. So, two minutes, come up with a list. Good luck. <laughs> and we will hear from you very shortly. So I'm curious to know what you have come up with. Who would like to go first? Go I'm finding um, a lot of the things on our list have to do with just being more flexible in the way we interact and the way we schedule things, and you know, just paying attention. Um, to um, kind of dropping our own ideas of how things have to be done and um, paying attention to other people's needs in general. I have like pay attention to, or um, so like pay less attention to our ideas of doing things and more in terms of meeting the needs, like meeting people where they're at. Kenneth and I were talking that often in team meetings, of course, we're always in a hurry. We've got to hurry. We've got to get through this person's stuff. How can we help them? Okay, we have the next person. We've got to move on. And sometimes just taking that extra time, maybe even just pulling that up an empty chair that represents the person you're talking about to help you say, okay, here's Susie. <laughs> now, what are we going to do for Susie? <laughs> and just making yourself be more aware of the person and not your challenge and the things you've got to do. Oh. I'm gonna wait until she's done writing. Okay. One of the ideas that we thought of was advocating the system to focus more on strengths. We were recognizing that many of the tools that we're given to do our work focus on, on identifying barriers rather than focusing on what the person's strengths are. So I advocate for the system to focus more on strengths versus barriers. Wow, nobody else has anything? <laughs> there you go. So we wrote down um, educate yourself, which I think we're, we're taking a step. Uh, share what we learn. Uh, persuade others. Uh, we certainly meet other folks in the community that have an element of um, uh, suspicion or fear or um, annoyance. And so 
so asking folks to, to put themselves in, in somebody else's shoes. And then also trying to see outside the checkbox. You know, so many of the duties that we have, you know, yes, you're eligible. No, you're not eligible. Yes, you're, you know, yes, you qualify for this. And no, you don't. But trying to see, see the person and not the checkboxes. I think that we have to be careful not to pity the people that we work with. Um, I think it, one of the things that would make me a better ally would be to make sure that I'm asking them how much support they feel like they need from me rather than how much support I think I need to give to them. What do you need instead of assuming? I, I think advocating for opportunities for meaningful participation for people with disabilities. And what I mean by that isn't, it isn't about just in the doctor's office. It's really about the policies that drive our agencies to do things. But the people um, or people with disabilities, I have to remember the disability part because I think of them as people. But anyway, they get um, a policy you know, that, that's affecting them, but nobody sat at the table when the decisions to make the policy was being done. And a lot of times they'll say, well, we'll, we'll let them know. We'll send them a copy of the policy or whatever. And it, that's not what I'm, my, it, they should be at the discussion before the policy is developed that they have to deal with. And I'm always looking in our agency opportunities to improve that and get meaningful participation. And we're a long way off from the vision that I have anyway, but um, hopefully, we change every time we get that opportunity. So if you've got a policy or your agency, ask that question. You know, we have them at the table, you know, and there's usually people that you know or somebody in the agency that you know would be a good fit for that and mentor them so when they get at the table, they're meaningful. You know, it, they're not scared to speak their whatever kind of thing. I think that's important too. If you're going to have meaningful participation, you have to have support. Um, kind of in the same line of thought, I've always, um, when doing work with people, try to do work with them and not for them to make sure that they are um, kind of doing as much work as they want to be doing in the process or, yeah. Do you have your hand up, sir? Our group um, does patient family-centered care. And so we brought a group together and asked them, what are their always moments? What are the things you want us to always do? And had the patients tell us the things that were the most important. And really, they weren't outrageous. They were very basic, reasonable requests. Moments defined by people. I like always moments, that's cool. Um, being sensitive to the environment, including what pictures and newsletters go in, um, how rooms are set up, um, that doesn't require somebody opening a door or moving a chair for access, um, and helping residents in a building um, understand respectful behavior and and uh, etiquette. I think just the one biggest thing is remembering how you yourself would like to be treated and just treating everybody the way you want to be treated. I mean, if, if you remember that, it's it's kind of simple. Nobody wants to be treated poorly themselves, so why would you want to treat another person poorly? These are great. Thank you. Awesome answers. I think this is the most comprehensive list we've gotten in all the days of training, so really hats off. We're not, we don't say that to everyone, too. It's not just, <laughs> it's not a line we, 
No, it's really. Next, we're going to discuss dignity of risk. Dignity of risk is a term that the disability rights movement defines as a freedom to fail and try new things. This might be something that others find to be a bit risky. For example, if someone decides they want to stop taking a medication because it makes them feel poorly, dignity of risk is all about presuming competence. It is about knowing people have abilities and have the right to make their own decisions. It is also about giving people support if they need it to make decisions and build people up for success using people's strengths. In all of our work, we need to remember to ask, what does the person want or say? For me, when, it when someone is supporting me to make a decision, I want them to be neutral. It is up to me to make the decision. Sometimes people make a choice that ends in a failure. The important thing to remember about failure is that it can be a blessing in disguise. You can learn from the experience and bounce back stronger than ever. The people that you care for as a healthcare professional have the same dreams and hopes as everyone else. To me, the dignity of risk means being able to make a mistake and not be held to a higher standard than someone without a disability. Supporting people to experience the dignity of risk is a great way to promote independence and confidence building in daily life. It also demonstrates that there are consequences for our decisions and, and that rights come with responsibilities. Now I have a question for you. Has anyone ever bounced a check or accidentally missed a payment? Raise your hand. <laughs> Did you have your checkbook taken away by anybody? That's good. <laughs> this is what often happens to people with disabilities when they screw up. The better solution would be to teach us how to budget our money so that we can turn a negative experience into a positive learning experience. This checkbook example has happened to me. Lots of us have experienced overprotection in our lives. When this happens to me, it makes me feel like people are stunting my growth and squeezing the life out of my hopes and dreams. So Nicole, can you tell us about a time when you took a risk that made a big difference in your life? You have a good answer. <laughs> well, go. back in uh, 2012, uh, my last semester of college at the UVM Succeed program, which is a special post-secondary ed program for people with autism and other disabilities. As part of that program, I you, people were required to do an internship, and I did an internship in Washington, D.C., the political universe at the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. I spent 10 weeks there. I lived in Washington Center housing. I got lost several times, like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone 2 on the Metro. Uh, I had one my roommate's parents uh, call APS on me because I misplaced my debit card and all that. That's an example of dignity of risk. I'd say, would you do it again? Yes. <laughs> I, I, love, I, love, I love cities like that. There's more to do, public transit. Great example. So we're doing, we're actually doing okay on time. We're, well, well, we're still gonna run 15 minutes of our own session, but we're okay on time in like the spectrum of being okay with time. Does anyone have any questions about uh, dignity of risk or presuming competence since we have a second? Ask away. I just want to bring this up as a case manager as that um, sometimes the people that supervise us um, really look um, down on the job we're doing when our clients fail. and sometimes hold us accountable for that in part and I feel like that's sometimes a conflict of us wanting the person to um, be able to make decisions independently even if they're not good um, but then um, you know having the case manager maybe look down upon if the person does fail because they feel that we're in part responsible for them 
I don't know if other people have had that experience. Just want to bring that up. The whole room works. <laughs> Want to speak to that in the room? Sort of interesting point. It's, it sheds light on a system that needs to like be redesigned. To because as a society, we're like risk adverse. We need to like shift. I mean, it, I think that that kind of speaks to the nothing about us without us component too, and having you know people with disabilities be sort of these sort of larger like decision makers at the table around sort of the the decisions that are being made sort of at all levels. I mean, it, it seems like that's in some ways a, an answer. Um. Good point as an answer. So like having agencies like hire people with disabilities as peer mentors to help shift culture, having people with disabilities on boards, on your board. It's how we define success. You know, the success might be that they took the risk, you know, rather than the outcome of the decision. So I think we have to look, when we say the word success, what does that mean? What are we really talking about? Because the success isn't actually the attempt. And sometimes we write it that way, attempted, and that is the success, was the attempt. Um, I wonder um, if what you are speaking to has anything to do with kind of like the, the larger system Earlier, you spoke about having an APS report um, made because of a, a choice that you made that ended in losing a debit card. And sometimes I wonder if supervisors or people that make big decisions in agencies are worried about legal ramifications of people making everyday bad choices with it, that's, that they're allowed to make. Um, and I was wondering if you, you guys have a relationship with people at the state to advocate on that level as well. For us as Green Mountain Self-Advocates, um, I mean, we, we sit on a lot of boards, like Developmental Services State Program Standing Committee, which meets every month. We talk about issues like budget, home and community-based rules. We vote to redesignate or de-designate agencies. So I, I, I'm going to switch over just to quickly talk a little bit about common courtesies and disability etiquette. And so when I say etiquette or common courtesies, what are we talking about? Like, what does that just mean in general? Like, what's etiquette? Behavior. Yeah, like, like how you behave. Yeah, like what you do when you're interacting with other people. So this is, sorry, just, so, so this is, um, you know, relates when you're working with people with disabilities. And we've had a lot of questions over the last few days about like, well, what do you do in this situation or that situation? And I mean, we could spend, there's this, just a, a wealth of resources out there online and like on YouTube. And, and I'd encourage you to get on the internet and sort of find some great resources that are built up because part of it is having conversations about, you know, what is like, between individuals to establish like, you know, what is our, um, you know, rapport going to be like and, and asking people, so what do you like? But then there's also all this legwork that's been done because there's a ton of resources just about common courtesies that you can do that initially start the conversation off on a really strong footing. So we actually, and there's, I think on your resource sheet in your folder, there is one resource that I want to point out, which is, um, and I can pass it around if you would like to, but the United Spinal Association has a great handbook on disability etiquette, and, um, and you can download it, or we can make photocopies for you. But there's also a lot of really great resources you can find in the state of Vermont's disability competency briefs, which are also online. There's just great information out there. So we're just going to quickly do a little film. Can you guys stay awake for like three 40-second long videos? <laughs> or power nap through them? <laughs> we're going to turn the lights down. But we're just going to quickly watch three videos just to kind of illustrate what kind of resources are out there. Um, Hi, I'm John. I'm going to tell you about disability etiquette gone wrong. I have aphasia. It makes it tough for me 
to respond quickly in conversation. When I go to a restaurant, it can take me a long time to give my order. I like to order myself as often as possible. If it's taking me a long time, someone may try to figure out what I'm trying to say by finishing my sentences. One time I wanted to order lasagna. The waitress kept on guessing. L words. Liver and onions. Lamb chops. Lamb shank. Lobster. Lasagna. Oh, lasagna. Disability etiquette. For me, means giving someone the time they need to say what they want to say. John. Nice to meet you. Oh, you must be an interpreter. Oh, tell her I'm glad to meet her and uh, I work here with you, sir. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop. Many people make the mistake of looking at the interpreter, but I need you to look directly at me. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know the etiquette. Um, I'm sorry about that. That's okay, it's okay, it's fine. My name is Jane, and I'm really excited to work with the kids in the after-school program. It's nice to meet you. Oh, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to meet you, um, and we're glad to have you aboard. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. The same goes for any kind of personal care attendant. It's fine to say hi to them, but when you're having a conversation, talk directly to the person. And if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. Just apologize and move on. What are some ways you can deal with these awkward situations? I'm Alberto Scanassi. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Moss Rehab in Philadelphia. And this is my story of how disability etiquette can go wrong. In my role as an educator, I have been very fortunate to be invited to lecture across the world. And I've been to places like Australia and Great Britain and Italy and Mexico. And all of those places have uh, given me the opportunity to interact with lots of different people. Uh, in my interactions with people around the world, uh, one of the things that I want to do is meet them and of course be met by them. And one of the awkward moments is when they have to shake my hand. Uh, they don't know if to reach for my hook reach for my hand, and most important, they don't give me an opportunity to reach out with my own hand so that I can feel the handshake. For me, disability etiquette means that when you are interacting with someone who has an artificial limb, you wait for them to offer their hand rather than you trying to reach out. And with this, you will avoid an embarrassing moment. hundred videos that I would love to show you and if I could hold you captive I would because um, they have a lot of great discussion points but um, this is just to kind of point out a resource that's out there for you because it can really um, go a long way in terms of having like it's just a toolbox of respectful ways to interact with people I think that it's just worth it to have it on your desk and GMSA also has a handbook to how to communicate with people and we'll talk a lot more about that in June um, so your final activity for today, and you have about two minutes to do it, is we have, sorry, is we have, if you look in your folder, um, handout number three, it's a letter, it says, Dear Future Me. And what it is, is it's, we'd just like you to take a minute and think about some of the things we've talked about so far today, and maybe pick out one or two things that you'd like to focus on or practice or try to remember between now and when we see you again in June, and just write yourself a couple of notes, and we're gonna collect them, and then we won't read them, we're just going to put them in envelopes with your name on them. So make sure you write your name at the top. And then we'll give them back to you in June. And you can just sort of see if you've remembered to or, you know, where you're at with that. So if you don't mind taking just a minute. 
Uh, but besides that, I think when you're finished with that, you get to go on break for 15 minutes. You've been awesome students. And also, uh, GMSA has a Facebook and Twitter page. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. And our Getting Your Message Across, which talks about meeting accessibility, can be found on gmsavt.org. It's free. All our materials are free, no charge. Thank you very much. And if you just hold it up when you're done, someone will come and collect your letter from you. So the last uh, topic that we're going to cover today is person and family-centered care planning and thinking. Uh, my name is Janice and I'm from the Vermont Family Network and I'm here today with Lisa, also from the Vermont Family Network. What I like to remind everybody, if I say things that are helpful, I want definitely to, for you to remember my name's Janice, but if I say things that are less than helpful, my name is Lisa and that is Janice. So how many of you have heard of the Vermont Family Network, just with a show of hands? Well, how many people have ever gone to our website and used any of our materials? A couple hands. How many people have suggested that a family give us a call? A couple. Okay, just a real quick background on the Vermont Family Network. Well, first, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you a little background on myself. The, the uh, thing to know about Vermont Family Network is just like Green Mountain Self Advocates is the organization of self advocates, Vermont Family Network is a family organization, and we provide peer support to families. And I use the word families in the most uh, open concept because families come in all different shapes and sizes, as we know. Um, just like Green Mountain Self Advocates, their self advocates uh, have a lived experience. It's the same with us at Vermont Family Network. We are parents of children with special health care needs, disabilities, mental health challenges. And just to briefly introduce myself, my husband and I, 15 years ago, uh, I was 44. I needed a new chapter in my life. So we adopted three children all at once, siblings. They were 5, 8, and 10. So uh, it was challenging. <laughs> I've lived with a lot of joys. My kids have brought a lot of joys in our life. But I have learned over the years about trauma, abuse, neglect. We've had uh, lots of issues with schools, uh, suspensions, learning disabilities, issues with the criminal justice system. Uh, and that's just an example. The other people at Vermont Family Network have different types of experiences with their children. And that's the strength that we br bring. We're able to support people at that peer level. Um, Vermont Family Network started 25 years ago. And it started with families getting around a kitchen table basically saying, we want more for our kids. We want them to go to school with the kids in the neighborhood. We want them to have the same life and be a part of our community. There are organizations like ours all across the country. Um, so I hope you will never doubt the power and the strength of the voice of the families um, because uh, it's there. And you're going to hear some from fa some family members uh, today that I have as part of our panel. So the way we uh, talk with families and the way we help families and children is, and if we could go to the next slide, uh, our mission, which I don't want to put anyone to sleep, is to empower and support all Vermont families of children with special needs. So we're a statewide organization. We have people in the field. We wish we had more people in the field. But the way we help people, and I like to think of it uh, along the lines of a continuum. So on one end, we're providing help one-on-one. -on -one. Someone calls us. They have an issue with their child. Maybe they don't even know what's going on, other than the school keeps calling them every day, saying, come and pick up your preschooler. Or um, so we help families that way. They identify what they need. We brainstorm together. We connect them with other parents. We um, share ideas. So one parent calls us, and they give us a really good idea. So the next parent calls us with a similar concern, and we say, hey, we heard a good idea from this other parent. So that's the connections, information, and support. That summarizes the three things that we do. Um, you notice in our mission statement the word special needs, and I want to take a moment to define what that is. How many people here work with children and families in, the, in your course of your work? So not too, too many. So special needs is shorthand for children 
with special health care needs, CSHN. We have a CSHN department here in Vermont as part of the Vermont Department of Health. And there's a specific definition for that, and I want to read that to you. It comes to us from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, and it's defined as those who have one or more chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional conditions, and who also require health and related services of a type or amount, amount beyond that required by children generally. So how many people here, if, if you feel comfortable in sharing, have a family member or extended family member that would fit that de definition? So I see several hands going up, very good. So I wanna share a few statistics. They shared some earlier with uh, concerning adults. And it depends on who you look to, you get different statistics. But the first statistic is from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. And that's that 15.1% of children in the US have a special health care need. And in Vermont, the statistic is 17.1%. There is another organization called Family Voices. And Vermont Family Network is the Vermont chapter of Family Voices. And they have a one in five campaign. I'm wearing their button here. And what they are trying to let everybody know is that across the U United States, at least one in five children has a special health care need. So we, I've already said children with special health care needs use more health care than children without special health care needs. So a few more statistics that I wanted to share. So what does that mean? Four times the number of hospitalizations, seven times the number of days of hospital care, seven times the number of annual visits to providers, and five times the number of prescriptions. The majority of children with special health care needs also have co-occurring health conditions. That's very, very typical. It's not unusual for us to talk to families who have a child with special health care needs. They have 20, 30, 40 providers in their life. So there's the question for people who are care coordinators. Who coordinates the coordinators? If you are so lucky as to have a care coordinator in your life, and not all families who have children with special health care needs have a coordinator. And the final statistic, and I have a flyer out on the table that has more of these statistics. Please help yourself to those that families of 25% of children, so one in four, either cut back in their hours or stop working altogether to care for their child. So I think you can imagine what impact that has on family life. So we talked about the word disability earlier. Here's just another term, children with special health care needs. And there are differences in use of these words. And as a training team, we got together. I never used the word disability with my kids. Someone else hates the term special need. So just you know, to add to our conversation about words and the importance. So for purposes of this module, we're going to use the word disability. Before I um, review our learning goals, which is on the next slide, I did want to just point out that I brought some materials. And you're welcome to take anything that's on the table. And it would be particularly helpful if you would take some of our rack cards with you, bring them to your organization. If you find any old ones that look like this, toss them because they're old. This will just help get the word out to families that we might um, uh, hear from. So the learning goals are on the next page, and they're also in your packet. The way we're going to get there is we're going to talk about some terms and build a shared understanding. Going to present some very specific tools you might use in your person-centered planning. I know that you also use some different tools, so hopefully maybe uh, spark some int interest in some new things that you might want to explore. And then about half the time that remains, we're going to have our two family members, and they're already here with us. Teresa and Shelley will be joining us. I have a few questions, and then there'll be questions, time for questions from the audience. So we have an activity to start with, the next page. So I want people to find maybe three other people, groups of four, four or five, and discuss among yourselves. Just going to take four to five minutes to do, to do this, and describe as much as you feel comfortable who is your chosen family. And I'm emphasizing the word chosen because this is not just people who are re related to you by blood, but who is in your chosen family? Okay, so four minutes, find, I know some of you are kind of spread out here. If you can find some other people, form groups of four to five, and then we'll pull back together in five minutes. Let's pull back together as a large group. What kind of differences did you notice? as how other people describe their families. Anybody notice anything when you listen to how other people describe their family? Anybody have more than one generation living in together or, or part of their family? No. Anybody have any four-legged family members? Yeah. yeah of course. <laughs> anything else that you noticed? 
anybody live in a different house, but you said they were part of your family. They didn't actually live in the same house, but they were part of your family. I see some heads shaking, hands going up. Okay, so the takeaway point here is that families define themselves. And that some families that you support and you work with, some families that come to us, they have a lot of family support. They have a lot of natural supports. Others don't have as much. And the last point is that there are real cultural differences in how families define themselves. I have the pleasure of working with uh, two individuals. One is from the Somali Bantu community and one is Bhutanese. And they both were always talking about their aunts and uncles and cousins. And I thought, my gosh, you know, you come from a huge family. Well, then they had to tell me that all the adults that are friends of their parents, they call aunt and uncle. And then consequently, all their children are their cousins. So they have a huge family. So I talked, I just mentioned natural support. So who here can define what I mean by natural supports? Anybody? Yes. Ah, you don't have to pay. Why do you think that's important to talk about when we're talking about individuals who have disabilities? Talk about natural supports. I'm thinking back to what Kirsten said about the people who step forward requesting support if they have a developmental disability and how 80% of those people don't qualify for home and community-based waiver. Those 80% of the people still want to have a good life and they're not going to get that level of support that a waiver is going to offer. I'm going to go to the next page and look at the definition of person-centered care. And, when, and I want to tell you first where this definition came from, because I could have used a lot of different ones. Um, I can, you can go to the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, and there's a definition there. I could probably ask all of you what you, what you think this means, and you might come up with a slightly definition. So, this definition comes from the Vermont Healthcare Innovation Project's Disability Awareness Brief, and there are six of them. They're from June of 2015, and the resource is listed on your resource list within your book. So does anybody want to read this definition out loud? Okay, well then I'll read it out loud. <laughs> the ability to engage, communicate effectively with, and take direction from the individual in decisions affecting the design, delivery and evaluation of care management activities and service delivery, including honoring and respecting the individual's choices to take some risk in engaging in life experience, the concept of dignity of risk. So I, I don't think there could be a sentence that has more action verbs in it, but <laughs> hopefully, the t the, hopefully one of the messages that comes through, it is about active participation. Person-centered care isn't a gift that you give to people. It's something that they actively participate in. And it's mutually beneficial to everybody that's involved. I want to give you a background of where this term came from. It actually started with the definition family-centered care. It was first articulated by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau in 1995. And it was defined by a team of family leaders and professionals. I want you to think about what was happening 20 years ago. 20 years ago, babies were being born who normally wouldn't survive, but they were surviving. Medical advances happened year after year after year. And many of those infants were surviving with the help of living in the hospital. We had ICUs at that time that had a lot of strict rules. A parent could go in for an hour a day, that sort of thing. So family-centered care then morphed over time into person-centered care. The PCDC trainers that were here last month reminded us that coordinated care is also person-centered care. Um, and if you, if you haven't gone to their website, the Primary Care Development Corporation, they were the trainers last month. So do people not go to that training? Okay. So, yeah, they, okay. this is day one for this. Group, oh, this is day this one. Is really so okay, very good. Okay. So you'll learn when you go to that training. They have a really good website with an um, introduction to care coordination, a manual right on their site that you could look at and download. So person-centered care is really for everyone. Family-centered care is when you're talking about a child being the focused person. And I think it goes without saying, the more complex the needs, the more um, helpful having person-centered care as your approach and your practice is to everyone involved. So I want to just ask people, you know, based on where you're at in your organizations, how far along do you think, so we've been talking about person-centered care, well, family and person-centered care for more than 20 years. So if you think we are really there, I want you to raise your hand really high, our organization is there. If you're kind of, eh, you're on the road, a little halfway hand. If you're not really just starting, just don't put your hand up at all. So we got some half hands, some way up high hands. Excellent, okay. 
So what I would like to suggest to you is even the people who raise their hand full on, if we were to have person-centered care um, really implemented at its best level, we'd have to make sure that everybody involved, including the people who are at the focus of the plan and all the people they invite on their team, also are getting the same information that you're getting today. So to, 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 to be doing this process, but not letting the people know that this is what your intent is and what their role in it is, is not really going to bring about the culture change that we're looking for. I did want to mention that patient and family centered care is endorsed by the Institute of Medicine, the US Department of Health and Human Services, and it's designated as one of the core components of medical home by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it's definitely what we've identified as the um, aspiration. Four values on the next page. I think Greenmount Self Advocates couldn't have done a better job covering what, are really, what is really at the heart of person-centered planning is that everybody on the planning team has to see the person as a whole person. They have to believe in their heart of hearts that the person does have the right to self-determination and control and that it is about active participation. I would suggest to you that not everybody knows, needs to know how to write a great plan, but everybody has to come to the table always with these uh, thinking and approach in mind. I'm going to skip the next slide. We'll come back to that. I, want to, I don't know if I should have labeled this differences in terms, but there's really three things that need to come together when we're striving towards person-centered care. So the first thing is the approach. The approach are things you say in your staff meeting, your policies within your organizations, the way the systems are designed, the placards on the wall, the brochures that you might hand out to patients. That's your approach. Are those things necessary? Absolutely. Will they alone get a person to have a better life? Definitely not. Secondly, as a plan, you can have all the best plan in the world, but if it's not really truly based on what's important to the person, then um, it's, it's a plan that really doesn't reach the final outcome of having the person have a good life. And to get to a good plan, we need to have that mindset. And when I use the word thinking, I'm going to be introducing and showing you a few person-centered thinking tools that you can use to discover information about the person that will in turn help you build a really robust plan. So this is just a broad brush, this next couple of slides, on some ber different person-centered thinking tools. And I know that some of you I've heard uh, are using things like, maybe you can show me by show of hands, people using eco-mapping, Camden cards, okay. We as a training team had not been trained in those particular approaches. So what we decided would be better is to present some tools that we have been trained in and we've used in our organizations just to spur some you know, new ideas and I, we, these resources did not end up on the resource list. We're going to send them out to you um, after the training, but I could also say them kind of slowly if anybody wants to jot some of these down. Um, we could do days of training just on these tools. And so I wanted you to have some resources where you can find videos, blank templates, completed templates. And, there's, and, and to keep in mind when you go to some of these resources, they're not healthcare focused or housing focused. These types of tools are used in lots and lots of different types of applications. They're used in educational settings while we're planning the transition of a youth from high school to life after high school. They're used for seniors. They can really be used in your own life. I had a colleague that used these tools with her father who was getting older and had, had dementia. So the first uh, site, and this is healthcare focus, is the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. You're gonna find a lot of resources on that site. We start to talk about some of these very specific tools. Uh, one really good site that a number of people in Vermont were trained on, uh, the tools come from um, an organization called Helen Sanderson Associates. They're out of the UK. Oh, the first one is the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. Uh, Helen Sanderson Associates. The Learning Community for Person-Centered Practices. And another really good one is Support Development Associates. Now, I want to say up front, when we're talking about these tools, and you're going you're to get a lot of information about a person, these tools are always designed to be used together. You're not just going to do one thing and say, ah, oh, we've discovered it. You know, we've done person-centered planning. 
So they're, they're designed to be used in combination. And the idea is also to take the learning from the use of these tools and make sure you're keeping that information somewhere. Have you ever been to a team meeting? All oh, this great information is discussed. Now you have the next team meeting. It's like, what do we talk about? So you're wanting to keep this. And in, in Vermont, I think uh, a lot of people are using what's called a shared care plan. Anybody using? I see a few heads shaking. Shared care plan. It doesn't replace the treatment plan, but whatever you're using to keep, uh, to keep track of the information. So let's just start with a few a few tools. So this slide, uh, no, go to the next one. So the purpose of the tools is to discover information about the, per the person that you can then use in, in planning. So this slide, each of those puzzle pieces represents a different tool, and we don't have enough time to go over each of these, so I've picked a few of them just to kind of give you the idea. But the thing I wanted to point out first, it, all of these tools are for the purpose of discovering what is important to the person, and then balancing that in what is important for the person. I hope if you remember nothing from today that you, at least from the part I speak about, <laughs> that you'll remember this idea of what's important to a person. So what do I mean by that? So let's look at the next slide. So the things that are important to the person are those things in life which help us be satisfied, content, comforted, and happy. So remember we did the wellness activity? That's the idea. Those are the things that are important to a person. But when you use these tools, you're going to dig much deeper. It's not enough for the person to say, oh, what's important to me is I like nature. It's really hard to build a, a very specific plan in a, a goal and a plan around why well, I like nature. So what does that mean? So it's digging deeper in all of those things. So in thing, things that are important to a person would, be inclu would include people to be with. Who are your friends? What relationships do you have? What things do you want to do, places you want to go, your rituals or routines, the rhythm or pace of life. Very important to understand what is someone's pace of life. What is their preferred pace? Is this a person who never sits down all weekend because they like to bike and garden, or is this a person who likes a lot of downtime? And the things to have or to own. So balancing that with what's important for. Important for issues around health and safety, and that would include both physical and emotional safety. And oftentimes, it's what others see as important to help the person be a valued member of their community. So I had an elderly parent, and I was very concerned about what was important for her safety, making sure she had nutrition. And I didn't spend a lot of time asking what was important to her. So the reason this is really important is as sometimes as people who are focused on health and safety is to get that balance and try to find out what's important to the person. So when you think about the people that you're working with and you're serving, what are some examples of the things that are important for a person? in the organizations that you work with? Transportation. Transportation. Access to healthy food. Healthy food. Maybe taking medicine. Going to physical therapy. You need to have a support person if you're going to want to do, do a certain activity. So those are all things that are important for a person. And so the trick with all of this, and the reason I haven't dug, I haven't, we haven't looked at any of those puzzle pieces with the individual tools yet, but the reason we're talking about this is that the goal is to find a balance. If something is important for us and also to us, it's probably something we're going to do. But if it's just important for us and has no element whatsoever of what's important to us, hmm, probably not going to do it. So I know the big thing now is motivational interviewing. I see people taking that. I don't know anything about motivational interviewing other than I don't like the title at all, like somebody's going to motivate me. <laughs> that makes me want to you know, not be motivated. But um, uh, So I don't want to suggest that the goal here is to try to convince something that what's important for them should be important to them, but rather to shine a lot of light on what's important to them and to try to find that balance. So if we really want people to, to, to do those things that are also important for them, we have to try to discover that element of what's important to them. Okay, so let's look at the first kind of set of tools. And this, this can look a lot of different ways. And I want to see, does anybody do, let's go to the next one. Oh, keep going. Oh, keep going. You're behind me. There we go. Here we go. Relationship map. And you can do this a lot of different ways, and I know this is a little bit small, but the idea here is the first tool is to put on paper, it might be a big piece of flip chart paper, whiteboard, whatever you use, and map out all the relationships that person has. And these are just three different examples of how you might do this. What you'll see in the one that says format A on the far left is there's free, three kind of groups, friends and associates, family, and paid support persons. When you do this, for a person who has a disability. What we frequently find is you don't have a lot of people up in the friends and associates category. You might have some people in the paid support. 
The middle is just a different way to represent the same thing. Sometimes you'll hear this idea called a circle of support. What's your circle of support? And there, this serves a whole lot of purpose. So simply seeing all the people that are in, involved in your life can really be energizing for people. It also can identify where there are some huge gaps. If you're working with a person and they don't have a waiver and they have no natural supports, that can be really telling, that you want to look at where some possibilities are that you might grow those natural supports. It's really a useful tool to also change relationships over time. If somebody gets a job, they're going to meet some new people, and that creates new connections. I moved from uh, Colorado seven years ago, and what I absolutely love about Vermont is it's like where you go, people know each other. You know, you start, you get people on a map and you put names on a map. It's amazing. People say, oh, aren't you the brother-in-law of so, of so and so who did the plumbing at, you know, and, and married? There's lots and lots of connections and you want to draw on those and you want to use person's network as much as possible. So that's, that's the very first suggestion. So I just wanted to make a real quick comment sure. on that. Um, and I think this might be illustrated a little bit when we hear from the panel of families this afternoon and they talk about being at the center and how complex it is to navigate that whole network. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a tool that can also, it can help the person realize all the different, um, you know, components of their support network, but also for the providers in the network to know who else they can work with to help better meet the person's needs. And I think that's where, you know, relationship maps, eco maps, whatever they are, can be really helpful tools as well in team-based care. I've gone to meetings, supported families in different kinds of meetings, sometimes school meetings or other meetings. And when I've asked the family a simple question, like, would it be helpful if, if somebody here just put a list of all the people that are involved in your life and what their name is, what their telephone number is? Oh, that would be so helpful. So just even putting it on paper, you get so many people involved, you, you forget who all the players are, especially if you're a stressed out parent on very little sleep. So the next tool, Again, I'm sorry that it's small, but when you go online, you'll see all these, and there's lots of variations of it. But this is called a personal profile. This isn't something you hand to somebody and say, hey, you know, this is your homework. Go fill it out. Bring it in the next time we have a meeting. But this is something that through a conversation with someone, not an interview, but a conversation where you're listening or a team meeting, you're filling in all the little pieces of this. So you'll see, if you can see it, it's small. There's a place for the person's photo. There's a place for what people like and admire about the person. That'd really be hard to fill out just by yourself because it's frequently people around you who see things about you that you don't see about yourself. There's a place to put what's important to the person. And for a good match, a lot of times we're looking for support people. What kind of characteristics would that support person have to have? And what kind of support does the person want to stay happy and healthy? This is a one-page snapshot, and it can be helpful in a lot of different ways. Um, in a lot of different arenas. It can be really helpful to orient, orient new members to a team. We have a bit of a crisis in Vermont as far as support people. Families will tell us again and again, they get a personal care assistant, let's say, for their child, and then that person is gone, and then the next person comes, and they have to train the person. Lots of coming and going of people on the team. It also can be used for very specific purposes, like if the person is getting a new job or wants to start doing something new in the community. It doesn't mean you have to limit yourself to detail, but it's just good to get a one-page snapshot. Okay, the next tool is called four plus one questions. You can fill in the blank at the top any way you want. So what have you done to improve? Maybe the person wants to volunteer in the community and they're not, they're not uh, being successful with that. So, you, so the columns there say, what have you tried? What have you learned? Uh, what are you pleased about? What are you concerned? And what are we going to do or try next? So it's a tool to uncover how is it that we're learning? What else can we learn about how the person is learning? The next one is good day, bad day. And the idea here is to sketch out in enough detail so you get more information about what's important to the person. So not good day is when I'm on vacation. Bad day is every work day, you know, that I have to go to work. So it's to get to a level of detail. All of us have routines and rituals and a pace of life. So I hope you see how these tools are starting to uncover it. It builds a picture about the person. 
and it helps them discover information about themselves. I've used these tools with my children as they have transitioned out of high school and they're figuring out what to do in their life. It's really interesting. It helps them discover things about themselves. So if you've never used these tools and you want to learn more, I'd suggest going online, looking at some of those videos, even trying them out on yourself or your family members and, or colleagues and seeing how it goes. So the big, another big picture idea I want to leave you with when we're talking about person-centered planning is that we really always need to be focusing on outcomes and not services. So an, an outcome is a specific description of an experience or situation that will exist as a result of specific actions taken. An outcome and a service are not the same thing. Services help us reach outcomes. And when I get a call from a family and I'm talking to them on the phone, I have to stop my brain because I immediately start thinking services. Oh, you could call COTS, you could da 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 And I lose the essence of what is it we're trying to achieve. So if someone says to you, I want a day program, is that a service or an outcome? Let's see, it's a senior. And they say, I want a day, I want a day program. Is that a service or an outcome? That's a service. So, and if you were to say to the person, this is how you get to an outcome, so you ask some questions. Say, so let's say you got that day program. How would your life be different? Or what, you know, what, what would be different if you had that? What, what kind of things might someone say? So you're digging deeper. You're trying to, they, then they have a trusting relationship with you. What, what, what kind of things might a senior, why might they want a day program? Socialization. For what, some companionship did I? You're meeting people. Okay, what else? Give my daughter a break. Give my daughter a break or give you, me a break from my daughter. <laughs> yeah, what else? What other kind of things? Better lunch. How about the lady next door? I kind of like her, and I know she goes to that day program too. Or they have a better television. Or I've heard they have cable, and I don't have cable. Or if they're really trusting, they might say, you know what, I can't really afford the heating well. It's kind of cold in my house. I'd rather be somewhere you know, where it's warmer. So I could, I could go on and on and list all the different reasons. So, so who cares? Why do you care about what the outcome is? And he, this is the suggestion I would leave with you, is when you dig deeper into the outcomes, you open the door to finding other alternative ways to achieve that outcome outside of a day program. If you go in and the person says, I want a day program, you might say, oh, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. We have eligibility requirements for everything. Or you're not eligible for transportation, so you can't get to the day program. And that shuts the door right on that option. But when you find out more why the person wants what they want, you might be able to think, well, you know, there's Meals on Wheels. There's a such and such visiting program that they could come over and visit you. So it opens up more possibility for creativity and brainstorming and hopefully having the person achieve more of their goals. There's a related concept, and I don't have a slide on it, but it's one that when we're asked to do workshops for parents around communication techniques, and it comes out of the world of special education, and it's called positions versus interests. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Shaking their head, yes. Well, let me just briefly describe it, because it's kind of the same idea. So as humans in our society and in the work that we do, we frequently go to a situation where we present our position. Our position is, I want someone to come in my home and visit me three times a week because that's the help that I need. And the other person says, ah, we can do two times a week. So you get stuck. Three times a week. No, two times a week. So using the same idea, so what would be different if you had the person visiting three times a week? So that's uncovering the interest. It's the same sort of idea. So when you find yourself really hardened and you want to open the conversation to more possibilities, try to dig deeper and try to get the, to those underlying interests. Okay, so in our next slide, person-centered care it goes without saying that the overall effectiveness uh, in creating a person-centered plan is really all about relationships. This is a lot of touchy-feely stuff on this slide, but this is the intro to my two people I've had invited to be part of our panel. But to build a strong relationships, of course, you have to build trust, you have to keep your word, trying to be empathetic, understanding the cultural differences, and really trying to take a moment to stand in somebody else's shoes. So with that in mind, I would like to invite up two family members that I've invited today, Teresa and Shelley. And I've done a few um, questions ahead of time, and we'll start with those. And Lisa's going to, in the background, run some pictures of their children that they're going to be talking about. I love this part where I get to be Diane Sawyer. I used to say Barbara Walters, but she's a little older. <laughs> she gets to talk to everybody, though. OK, so the first question is an easy one. And either one of you can start. So can you just start by telling us about your family? 
Whose pictures are up here first? Who, talks? <laughs> Who wants to talk first? Lisa, I'll go first. Okay, so Teresa's going to tell us about her family first. So it looks like these pictures aren't in any particular order, but um, I'll just talk a little bit about my family. We have a family of four. My husband and I are both college educated. Um, we had a spontaneous twin pregnancy in 2001, and um, I had great. Can't see the slides. Oh, you know what we did? did we dimmed the lights yesterday. That did help. I had oh. excellent prenatal care and um, a really healthy pregnancy, um, but my boys decided to come at 30 weeks of gestation. And uh, it wasn't until later um, that we learned that um, my son Joe's placenta had an infection. Um, so we were, we were in the NICU for two months, Fletcher Allen, and um, at day 41, my son Joe was diagnosed with periventricular leukomalacia, um, which was devastating news for us. Um, that was determined through a cranial ultrasound. Um, Cerebral palsy was diagnosed for him at about five months' age, um, having follow-ups with a developmental pediatrician. Um, that was later kind of more clearly defined as spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, um, which is kind of partnered with uh, cortical visual impairment. Uh, GERD, he's nonverbal, um, though he's very communicative. Um, he understands everything and um, can respond to questions and sometimes vocalizes words, but um, relies currently on a communication device. How old is he now? Um, he's 14 year old. He's an eighth grader at Wilson Central. Um, we have used a full inclusion model at the school um, and participating in classes with all of his peers with adaptations and accommodations. And he has typical 14-year-old interests. So he loves popular music. Uh, he loves movies, eating out, hanging out with his friends, flirting with girls, sports, social media, anything that you would expect a 14-year-old boy to do. He's very much like his twin brother. Um, and you know, his needs are not just physical. Um, you know, the wheelchair is an important part for his daily routines, but he also has needs around his emotions, and those things are just starting to come out for him, um, seeing the differences between what his brother can do and, and what he's not able to do because of his needs. Um, he spends a lot of time worrying. Um, he thinks about the well-being of others. He's very empathetic. Um, like I said, he's not able to do a lot of things that his brother can do, but he also has a lot of opportunities. You can see the joy that he has in going to camp and participating in the St. Mike's lacrosse team. Those are huge, special activities for him, and um, those are wonderful opportunities that we might not have been able to do um, without his special needs. Um, he, um, he's our teacher, and he has taught me an awful lot about what's important in life and how to kind of get through your day um, and be happy despite lots of challenges. And that's how I would describe my son and my family. Shelly, you want to say a bit about your family? Sure. Oh, just a, um, I do not have yours in a, in a slideshow, so I'm going to have to keep opening and closing pictures. Well, once you get to one, usually you can. I it doesn't do that. Oh, because it's an apple. Okay. We'll, we'll see a few pictures. I only have a few anyway. That's fine. So he, Shelly can tell us about her family a little bit. Um, hi, I'm Shelly Waterman. I'm very, very, I feel very honored to be here today. I always love talking about my family. Um, so thank you for being here to listen. Um, so I, I did bring some pictures um, because sometimes it's a little bit easier for me to show you who we are than to, it is to just sort of tell you who we are. Um, I have two beautiful daughters. Hannah is 14 and Hadley is 11. Um, my husband, Scott, was born and raised in Shelburne and I grew up in Burlington. Um, we live in Burlington. Um, Hannah attends Lyman C. Hunt Middle School and um, Hadley um, attends Flynn Elementary School. Um, we are just the Watermans, the 
The thing that kind of makes us unique is that Hannah was born with a condition called Rett syndrome. It's a neurological degenerative disorder that primarily affects girls. Um, so that's, that's the four of us there. Um, but I mean, as you can see, that, that's really us. We're pretty happy. Um, Hannah attends school. Um, we pretty much made an inclusive, an inclusive model. Um, and um, about three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, um, we were sort of delivered another curveball when Hannah was diagnosed with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, which is a, it's a um, intractable seizure disorder. Um, so she was having pretty significant seizures that were having a tremendous impact on not only her quality of life, but our quality of life. Um, I worked at Vermont Family Network with these lovely ladies um, and I left my job um, because I needed to be full-time mom. And during that time, and, and this is sort of where, um, you know, I could go on and on about my family, but really um, just to sort of share with you that our family was really in crisis, all four of us. Uh, it was about all of us. And any of the things that we had done previously in our lives, traveled, gone to the beach, um, spending time in Cape Cod, um, going to the movies, um, anything that you can possibly imagine doing, we really weren't able to do anymore. Um, and we were doing these things in spite of the fact that the world really isn't very accessible to do those things just with Rett syndrome or, um, you know, things of that nature. And so, um, so life got really hard, and we really had to focus on our community that we had built and that sort of we continued to build during that time um, to get us where we are now, which is a, in a completely different place. Um, Hannah is attending school regularly. Um, she was uses a Toby Igaze communication system, um, and so we work with that. Um, you know, we have just kind of come out of this with a new lease on life, and I look at the world differently, and I feel as though, you know, any of the things that are challenging for, for me to think about, um, if I can impart anything on all of you today as people who are potentially going to be in the position to help others that are in situations that are similar, you're changing lives and you're gonna make a difference with the work that you're doing and learning um, during this week. So I wanna thank you for that. So let's move on to the next question. We talked about uh, what's important to and for family. So I wondered if you could tell us what's important to your son or daughter and your family and how is that what's important to the, to you and your family reflected in the care plan? And you could mention too whether or not you have a care coordinator as part of your life. Okay. Whew. So I'll go first, Shelley. Uh, uh, so I'll go, I'll go first. So okay. we do have a care coordinator. Um, we actually belong to an incredible medical home, um, Hagen Reinhardt and Connolly Pediatrics, and. Um, one of our primary care coordinators is Christy Trask, who is, um, who is one of the nurses there. Christy also partners with um, a nurse from the VNA who is part of our um, pediatric palliative care program. Um, and so really they, they, I reach out to them whenever there's a need. Oh, and, and I should back up and say there's actually one more um, player in all of this, and that is our school partner. So nothing can work without the three of them being able to communicate, um, and communication is the absolute most important piece here. Um, what was the other question? Well, just is, is what's important to you reflected in the care plan? So when, so pretty much all of, uh, Hannah's care plan has been pretty fluid. Um, 
you know, because of the fact that there have been many curveballs that have been thrown, um, you know, when it was a matter of her just having Rett syndrome, we were pretty much focused on communication for her and making sure that everyone on the team knew that that was a priority. And how can we impart information onto the school team? So that's just one piece. School was a huge part of being a kid, learning how to be social. And then there was the medical piece. And so we continuously um, reached out to our medical home, our pediatrician, to help those two things, school and the medical piece, be in alignment. Um, and that was really, really critical. And, and it was a learning curve. None of us knew what we were doing. There's no roadmap, so we sort of had to build it as we went. Um, when things really changed, and this model really, really, really played a significant part in our lives, was when Hannah developed the seizure disorders, and we were facing other complications. Um, and, and one of those complications was sudden death. And that is really hard to talk about and to accept and to wrap your brain around when you're talking about a child who wants to attend school, whose parents want them to attend school. And so um, as a team, her school providers, um, my husband and myself, and her uh, pediatrician and our nurses, we talked about Hannah's the priority. How can she continue to have a quality of life that still includes school and all the social, the socializations that come with that? And it took every single partner providing input and feedback to come up with the plan that we have now that has actually worked out probably a lot better than we ever could have hoped for. So Shelly, can you just comment on what does the seizure disorder look like? One seizure a week, once a month? I mean, what, what, will we, what sure. frequency? So the frequency of Hannah's seizures, they vary based on, um, we're not really quite sure what it varied on, but any, any given day, she was either having transitional seizures from waking up from bedtime, and that evolved into um, some seizures so significant that even though we had her bed enclosed, she was able to throw herself out of bed. Um, so that required full-time care um, to maybe just uh, a few blips during the day. Um, the part that made it significant was when she would go into seizure cycles where um, even her rescue med wasn't stopping the seizure, so she would sleep then wait back up and then go back into a seizure cycle. And so there were so many things that were unknown um, that it was just really tricky to heart. And if I can just add a personal thing, Teresa and I are friends. We worked together. We've kind of grown on this journey together. And there was one day that just out of the blue, Teresa was going to stop by. And it just happened to be on a day that I was giving Hannah a bath without a caregiver and I thought gosh you know she needs a bath but I'm nervous to give it to her in case she has a seizure and didn't she have a seizure and as that was happening Teresa walked through the door and she was like hello and I was like Teresa I need some help and she came and she helped me get her out of the tub and so when we're talking about like those natural supports or people that are part of our tribe Teresa is a part of my tribe. Okay, uh, Teresa, how about this? <laughs> a hand for having a tribe. So the, so the second question, so what was important to, you, to your son and your family, and how is that reflected in your care plan? I would agree with a lot of what Shelly said. Um, really important things for my family and for Joe are for that, that he have age-appropriate interactions and experiences. You know, he... He's very delayed in terms of his motor skills. And people tend to underestimate him, especially when they learn that he can't talk. But he has interests that um, are typical 14-year-old things. So it's really important that things that he gets as gifts are age appropriate and not like a baby rattle because he can't hold on and navigate things. Um, we always want to see Joe as a person first. 
he's not defined by his disability and you know we don't focus on the wheelchair and calling it cerebral palsy like he's Joe and we don't want people to focus on what those needs are people don't call me uh, you know Teresa that wears glasses you know why should people say that's Joe who has CP so um, health and happiness are always priorities for Joe um, we try to involve him in as much decision making as we can um, he is able to make choices and you know the way he makes choices is different than having a conversation but we can offer him choices verbally and he can give us a yes no response to the one that he likes um, which is kind of transferred over to his electronic communication you see some samples of those um, communication boards that he navigates by listening to those words be announced and um, clicking a head switch to choose those options. So his communication is very slow, very labored, and requires a really strong communication partner, but he can tell us what he's thinking. And he, you know, he just needs the time and patience to be able to say those things and to learn where to find those words on that complicated device. Um, he needs coordinated care. You know, we see a variety of different specialists around the medical community, and it's hard to get those specialists to talk to each other. You know, our um, pediatric home is um, really good at trying to keep those things coordinated. Um, I also use the same medical practice as Shelly does, and Christy Trask is really important in our world. Um, we do care conferences every six months just to stay on track of what's happening with all the specialists, whether it be pulmonology, whether it be orthopedics, vision. Um, there's a lot of things that have to come together for, in order for Joe to kind of get through his day. How many specialists do you have involved in your life? Uh, Could you I haven't estimate? counted them recently. I have an outdated eco map that I had created for myself, but I, I would say over the course of a year we probably see eight to ten different specialists. Um, so um, those care conferences kind of keep those things gelled together and um, keep our priorities kind of in the forefront about what we need to focus on at the moment. Um, right now we're kind of focused on a wheelchair purchase and some equipment that's really difficult to um, put together and we need to kind of think of those as a whole picture thing. It's not just about purchasing a wheelchair. We have to think about what's the best positioning for Joe so that he has vision access. What's the best positioning to kind of slow down the progression of the scoliosis? What is the best positioning that's going to give him um, the ability to mount his communication device? So there's lots of facets to any decisions that are made. It's not just a simple part of he needs a wheelchair, here you go. So it sounds like those health decisions are really important because it helps create the quality of the life. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And you know, our our pediatric office has been really helpful for us to create specialized little individual plans that cross over to school. So as an example, he has a feeding plan. He has very specific accommodations so he can be safe with eating. Um, we have to have a safety plan. What, what is the plan if there's an emergency evacuation at school? Because he can't just go on the bus with his peers. He needs to have a special plan in place. Um, what is his health plan if he has an asthma breakdown at school? How do we manage that? Um, so those little pieces, you know, the school and the medical have to kind of coordinate and keep those together in one place. So the next question is, how do you help your son or daughter build their self-advocacy skills over time and, to, and, make sure, and also make sure that their voices are always heard? You know, when people learn that Joe isn't able to speak verbally, um, they tend to kind of defer to the caregiver that's with him, which is, you know, sometimes necessary. You know, you have to ask questions about how to best communicate with Joe. Um, I tend to say, I don't know what the answer is that. We'll have to ask Joe. And I'll kind of model for people how to give him choices and, and to how to read those nonverbal expressions on his face, how to wait for the communication device to kind of scan through for him to give his response. Um, partner assisted scanning is kind of what we use as a backup when the electronic version isn't available and that is basically just asking Joe a question, telling him how many choices are for his answer and kind of listing those out with pauses once 
so he knows what his choices are, and then listing them again with pauses and waiting for him to respond to the one that he likes. Again, it's a very slow process, but Joe has enough cognition, he can respond to those appropriately, and we can always count on his answers being accurate. Um, a big goal in his IEP is for him to kind of speak up for himself and self-advocate, so that's a goal on his service plan at school. Um, and we're also working on increasing the complexity of his language output so that he can better express what he's thinking. Um, and I also have to work really hard to kind of help Joe feel comfortable being in the community using an electronic communication device. It's a very rare thing, especially in Vermont. And a lot of times he'll tell me he doesn't want to bring that device out in the community because he feels like it draws attention to him. Um, he doesn't have a lot of confidence using it in a group setting yet, so um, you know there's still work to be done with that. Um, and we are constantly looking for opportunities for him to have access to other people that use augmentative communication so that he can kind of normalize his own experience. Um, it's a um, really expensive piece of equipment and we want to maximize his use of it. And um, you know, it's a complex communication system that he needs to practice and keep practicing. How about you, Shell? You want to comment on that question about self-advocacy skills and how to make sure that sure. your daughter's voice is heard? Sure. Um, so what, what has made sort of planning for what I was going to share with you today a little challenging for me was because, you know, we've, you know, my Hannah and my family, we've been in a shift. Um, over the last few years and so you know the self-advocacy piece I you know I really feel as though um, that has taken shape a little differently than we had hoped um, but I still think it's been effective um, which is we really model um, how how we want Hannah to be spoken to very similar to what you know Teresa um, and Sean do for um, Joe and, and with Parker. Um, you know, one of the unique um, outcomes that, that we reached, um, you know, as a, as a care team was that um, the priority was Hannah going to school. A aside from having a quality of life and becoming healthy again. Um, we decided that it would be in Hannah's best interest and we focused on her to have a para that focused on the education piece at school and then to have me be a secondary para at school with her to support all of those um, intricacies that just can't be explained when it came to Hannah's health because oftentimes the health piece really can be a barrier for the academic piece. So. You know, it's unique in the sense that Hannah's self-advocacy is because we just model it. I mean, she may not be able to speak one single word verbally, but the fact that she attends school regularly on any given day um, really, I hope, speaks volumes to everyone around her. Um, so really, the advocacy piece, it can look so different for so many families. Um, we do use an eye gaze communication system for Hannah to make choices and it's, and it's very complex and when she was having so many seizures it just was not the best option and so we did go back to partner assisted scanning. Um, now she's able to use her um, Toby a little more effectively. Um, in fact, she attended, she started attending social studies again, which was a huge accomplishment because it's early in the morning. And when her teacher was saying, good morning, Hannah, and she was on her social screen, the first thing that she said to him was, go away. And I was just like, that's not a really great way to start your social studies experience, but there you go. Um, so I, I think the thing that I just want to impart is that um, philosophically, Many families want the same thing for their children. It's just you sometimes have to go about it in a different way mm -hmm. based on what's happening for your child at any given moment. And 
and it and it takes a team to be able to think outside the box to make that happen. Did I answer the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just one last question, and we're going to open it up to the group. So if your son or daughter were here today. Uh, what might they want to say to this group? They did have these questions ahead of time, so just everybody knows that. Anything that you think they might like to say to the group, knowing who's here? Well, um, you know, she's, she's a 14-year-old girl, first and foremost. She'll be attending the dance on Friday. Um, you know, she's a person. She wants to be talked to like a person. Um, you know, mom and dad can worry about, you know, Rett syndrome, Lennox Gasto, feeding tube, seizures. We can worry about all of those things. But just to, and, and even for my younger daughter, because it does impact the siblings as well, we, she just wants to live a good, full life being respected and, um, I wrote some things down, um, you know, and to just, have accessibility, um, assuming that everyone will assume that she's competent and that you know she'll have that she wants the same opportunities that every other peer her age has, you know whether she's 14 or 44, um, and we will always be there to support her. And I think that's what she would say. I hope that's what she would say. Mm -hmm. Teresa, anything you want to add to that? I would add to that. Um, as Joe's finishing eighth grade, you know, all eighth graders at Williston Central School are required to do an eighth grade challenge. And Joe and I talked about what he was gonna do and we decided together that he wanted to do an all about me to share with his incoming um, high school team so that he could help them know who he was before he arrived at school. And so I'll just read a few of the things that he wrote with his communication device um, as part of his presentation. And I wish I had pictures of it, but I, I couldn't figure out how to take a screenshot and put it in my slideshow. But um, he wanted his incoming um, freshman team to know that he can swim, talk, make art, play music, and read. That he likes bowling, french fries, taxis, and dad. That he doesn't like masks, sheep, or when others are frustrated that his favorite sports are bowling, baseball, skiing, and he runs to raise money. Um, his wish for high school, I don't know where this came from, but he wants to eat breakfast and play softball and baseball. He said, I have feelings. He said, my favorite things in school are PE, science, social studies, language arts, and recess. He wants everyone to know that he goes to summer camp every year and that he's just like everyone else. And he said he communicates by using a Chromebook, glasses, a program, the internet, his body, a camera, and music, but he speaks with his accent communication device. And he said, I can write with my Chromebook, and he does that every day. Um, and he teaches doctors about cerebral palsy. Before I open up this, uh, open this up to questions, I wanted to just um, mention one thing, and that is yeah, Teresa. Sorry. Oh, sure. You had, want I, I had a poem that Hannah had written that I wanted to. Oh, wonderful. To share, and I also um, Hannah put together a video with one of her peers about um, for a, um, a project that they did at school, and it's really, really short. And I just wanted to show. <laughs> if if we have time, it's really yeah. really quick. Yeah. Just so, so yeah, let's yes. do the video yeah. and then we'll have the poem. It is Poetry Month, isn't it? It's April. Drugs are a calamity, ripping you apart like you are an innocent piece of paper. Drugs turn you into a criminal. Destruction. You can cause pain and cause like cheer that works. Would you want this? Mostly 
basically every person who does drugs ends up behind bars. Don't do this to yourself. Don't do drugs. with her partner and with um, her other paraeducator, they had to create a script for what they wanted to talk about for the project. And so um, there, Hannah had opportunities to choose between big core topics and then some of the language that she wanted to use. And then once we put all of that together, we were able to put it on her um, Toby. So all she needed to do was look at the Toby and the phrases were there for her, and so we just added it to the video that they put together. So it wasn't just her peer doing the whole thing, it was that Hannah really engaged in the process. And then, I don't know, the, the poem is just up there, but I don't know. Again, it was sort of just Hannah being able to make choices of the things that were really speaking to her, and I think that was done at the beginning of the year as well. Writing a poem about a regular September day, my morning spent at school, middle school by now. In the afternoon I play at the shores of Lake Champlain. We sit in the sand, my little sister and I, and I snuggle with my funny cat Matilda. Later on, at home, while the daylight fades away. Shelly's spare time, she's worked for uh, Greater Accessibility at North Beach. So if you've ever been to North Beach in Burlington and you've noticed the ramps, well, Shelly and others worked with that. But I'm, on, I'm just because I'm on the Accessibility and Inclusion Committee, but there was another family that was really, really completely devoted to that. At project. the lead of that. Yes. Okay. So what kind of questions from the audience? That was the last question that I had prepared. Get a microphone to you. It's one over here. It would really be great if someone over here asked a question, then we could see Aaron run back and Get forth. So sense. could you, it's really fun. <laughs> I'm just wondering if there is a, like a support group for um, families that have children with Brett syndrome in the area, um, or if you're connected with any other families. Okay. Well, I, I, I am. Okay. I, do you have someone in your life that has Brett syndrome? Um, it's our neighbor. Yes. Our, our neighbor. Um, their family, their daughter has Rett syndrome. So I, I just didn't know because it's, you were talking about it that another woman who has an older daughter who has Rett syndrome, I just didn't know it's, if, if there was something like that here. So there are so few of us um, at the moment. I believe that there are only five girls in the state that are identified. Um, but through Vermont Family Network, I'm sort of identified as one of the parent matches, um, and um, I we we can also check in after too. But um, you know, if there is ever a family that is looking for a parent match or just other parents to connect with, Vermont Family Network can um, support those relationships. I don't think I mentioned that, but that is one of the things we do at Vermont Family Network. So if someone comes forward and says they would like to be matched with another parent who has a similar experience, we have parents who have said that they will offer that level of support. So we get everybody's approval in advance, we exchange contact information, and then the people talk to each other two to four times, usually over the phone, and they share experiences, practical tips, um, information that's been helpful. And we find that that's a big, huge support. Parents really feel alone and feel isolated oftentimes, so meeting another parent who has a similar experience. Any other questions, or what other questions people have? Many moons ago, um, my daughter was the first daughter diagnosed with Rett syndrome in Washington State, so it goes way early. Uh, and she lives here now in Vermont and has for the last four years. But just to say, just because there's five families that you may know of Rett syndrome, what we found out there, there was five families. We got together in my living room, and there is the Northwest Red Syndrome Foundation. It's regional. And what we do is a lot of sharing and changing of equipment, you know, and things like that. So I wouldn't put that possibility down in the state of Vermont because we are so connected. Mm -hmm. But I look at New Hampshire as well. And, you know, bringing in other people, there are people... Um, children and young adults with Red Syndrome in New Hampshire as well. So the power of parents is always been just amazing to me how they can bring together. And we do share some um, 
you know, we're all with children with disabilities, but children with Rett syndrome have some specific needs. And there is some frightening times. When you were talking about your frightening times, been there. Um, I can tell you it actually gets better in some ways. And so, and but the one thing I wanted you guys to talk a little bit about that was really a challenge for our family, and that was the funding. As there's multiple systems that take care of our children, but with that comes multiple funding. And in Washington State, anyway, because I didn't raise my child here in Vermont, we've got, um, you know, well, that's an educational need. I'm talking about therapy, PT. No, that's a medical need. Medical needs back, forth. In the meantime, you're trying to get services for your child. And I know that we're blessed here in Vermont with Dr. D. We weren't blessed with Dr. D, but we did get the um, Katie Beckett waiver, which is what you were talking about here, um, which changed our life. But so many families with children with disabilities, and as providers, we don't think about how are they going to pay. You know, the, the thing, what we do with outreach, where I work now, is we're always thinking about the payment part. That's our job. That's our outreach department job. And I think um, with children with special needs, it's so impacting. There was a study I read that 25% of your income is control average is control about your needs for your child with special health care needs. Think about that. If you had your paycheck come home to you and you had to take 25% and throw it out the window and then live like everybody else. And I, I often thought that we were a middle class family income wise, but we lived in poverty. And the reason was for all these things. So a couple of challenges that always comes to my mind when we deal with families with children with special needs is, you know, how's it going to get covered? You know, our dreams are great, but how's the financial part? And how's that going to impact that family? So I just wanted to say most families that I've dealt with, this is huge. And nobody likes to talk about the financial ends. They're our child. We'd spend any money in the world to get them better, you know. But how do we do that and at what sacrifice? is that to our families. So does Shelly or Teresa, do you want to comment on the funding issue dealing with insurance companies? Well, it's definitely a big challenge. Um, you know, we're kind of lucky in Vermont because we have Katie Beckett access and um, my family's been able to carry private insurance and Katie Beckett for my son. So we haven't had a lot of medical expenses that haven't been covered, but we have been challenged with things that there's no funding anywhere for. So we had to do a home modification. There's just no money out there to help with that. Um, so we kind of had to get creative and we were fortunate to be granted um, a home modification through Howard Center. We feel really, really blessed by that. It's changed our lives. It's made the caregiving so much easier. Um, you know, my sons only get bigger and heavier and harder to move around and um, having a space that works for his access needs is really critical. Um, another barrier for so many families is access to an adapted van. You know, trying to get around the community um, with a wheelchair is very difficult and um, there's no funding out there to help pay for adapted vans. So, you know, we have to beg, borrow and steal and save as much as we can to kind of keep those things going and it's constant worry that we have. Okay, our van is working today, but what happens if it breaks down? We don't have a cushion there to kind of just replace it, and um, that changes our whole lifestyle to not be able to get out in the community. You know, one of the things that I learned, I, I, I learned early on, and I, and I will say that um, I have been very fortunate um, in terms of I have had so many wonderful mentors and people in my life that are on a similar path as us. Um, it, it didn't matter what their child's diagnosis was. It was just that we're sort of, we really are all in this together. I mean, if I have a friend who is having trouble accessing a van, well, you know, my daughter may only be three right now, but at some point that's going to be us. What can I do to support them? And, you know, I think in particular, because I also worked at Vermont Family Network, it was like I had that built-in network, which not everybody has. And I recognize that more so since I have left there. Um, but the one piece in all of this, I think that, and I keep coming back to, and I don't want to use the word resentment, 
but it's a challenge for families who, if, if, if Hannah didn't have the complications that she has in her life, we would probably be going about our lives just swimming along with everyone else. But honestly, at every turn, I felt as though I've had to create a voice for myself. I had to create a voice for my family. I had to partner with my friends. We had to find a collective voice because nobody was going to hear us otherwise. And I'm sure as a parent, you can understand and appreciate how I, I need a piece of equipment for my child. If you need a piece of equipment for your child because your child really needs that and you have to jump through 20 hoops, you can guarantee that the other parent whose child needs equipment or something similar is probably going to have to jump through the same 20 hoops. We need to get rid of those 20 hoops. We need to be able to go to one or two people and know that they're going to be able to advocate for us. And that's where, you know, the we are able to fall back on that family-centered piece from our medical home because since that has taken place, it's also saved my mental health. You know, I, I, I wish that people would put automatic doors on every door in the state because we're all gonna need to be able to get in that same door at some time, whether you have a lifelong disability or you have a broken arm or a broken leg, we're all gonna have to get through the same door. So doesn't it make sense to do everything the right way the right time because I have an answer for everything. Teresa and I, uh, us moms, we can fix the world if you just listen to us. <laughs> um, but sometimes you have to put your voice out there even when you don't want to, even when you just want to be private in the hopes that not only it will make a difference for your child, but it's going to make a difference for any of the other children, adults, and, and people in your community. And, and hope that somebody else in that community is going to help carry the torch as well. I want to answer a question that was asked in two other sessions. This is the fourth session we've done. And this, this type of question was a, a, asked in two of the sessions. And I didn't answer it. And it's really been bugging me that I didn't answer. So the question went something like this. Uh, Janice, you invite in family members, and I've had different family members at all four sessions because they were different locations. But the families I work with are not like the families you brought in. The families that I work have a lot, a lot of those social determinants of health. Maybe they live in poverty. Maybe they too also have a disability. So, you know, it's just, how is this helpful? Because these people really, they got it going on. They know the systems. They've got great supports. And I sat when uh, the person in yesterday's meeting even said, uh, and she used this word, she says, people I work with, they're, they're just not as intelligent as the people that were on the panel yesterday. And it just bugged me that I didn't say anything about that. So I, I kind of did a Donald Trump thing, and I had a little meeting with myself <laughs> during lunch. And I wrote some ideas down just because I want to get a little conversation going, and I don't want it just to wake me up at 2 AM in the morning. But I thought, you know, how would I have responded to that? And I guess the first thing I would say, because I was talking to Teresa and Shelley a little bit about this, is they are at a place in their journey where they can reflect and talk about it. And they do have probably more than average family supports and natural supports. But they built that over time, and they learned over time. If I would have asked both of them to come on a panel a month after they had learned about their diagnosis of their child or what was going on, I think we would have heard a very different story. And they both agreed with me on that. I guess the next thing that came to mind, we've talked about this, as much as possible, always focusing on the strengths, finding someone who that you're working with is doing something right. If my kids taught me no other lesson, it was that I was going to get more of whatever I decided to focus on. And if I focused on the bad behavior, I was going to get plenty of it. And if I focused on all the good things they were doing, I was going to get more of it. Um, I would also suggest to do as best you can to make the necessary accommodations and modifications. Although we haven't had a chance to talk about parents who have disabilities, we find that parents with disabilities are much more likely to lose the right to parent their children, and that is a whole nother topic for another day. But to know that there are organizations out there, there's also guidance. It came out about, I want to say, six to eight months ago from the agency, the US Agency of Human Services and the Department of Justice um, around the federal requirement to make modifications and accommodations for people who have disabilities, parent, in, who are in the parenting role. There's also an organization called the Vermont Communication Support Project. If you don't know about that, that's something to maybe Google and to learn about. 
There's another organization called Sage Haven Associates. They can do assessments for people, parents who have disabilities, to see what they need to be a, uh, to stay in their parenting role. Uh, Pathways Vermont offers a free program to anybody who wants to attend called Intentional Peer Support. Some other ideas that came to mind is, um, and we're going to talk about this in future uh, sessions, is supported decision making. What does that look like when the focus person wants one thing, when the people around them want something else? What does supported decision making look like? One of the things we've done at Vermont Family Network is if you can, hire people who have the lived experience. So. We forever kept trying to reach the new American communities, and we never could reach them. And then we thought, ah, why don't we hire someone from those communities? So it's just hap happening naturally, because those people are now in our staff. I would say to reach out to the colleagues in other organizations as, as well, to try to create and bridge systems and ideas. Um, my colleagues will tell me, and one of my favorite <laughs> sayings when we sit in meetings is we spend a ton of time what, doing what I think is admiring the problem, and what we need to do is take all of that energy and resources and create new and better systems. And um, we talked earlier about GMSA, and I think you are all in a place to be allies, and if you want to do that at a systems level, uh, get connected with the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights. They'd be like your new pen pal, because they send weekly updates during the legislative session to tell you what's going on. And uh, if you can help parents by helping them connect with other parents and other supports. So those are just some of the, oh, and then my final thing is I put never give up hope, because that's what we always <laughs> say. I live in the mental health world, and I facilitate a monthly support group for family members, so we always end with that uh, comment. So any, anything anybody else wants to add to my my conversation with myself. Yeah, oh, you want to add some things, yes. <laughs> I, I would just like to say that, you know, even though I come across in this public setting, like put together, educated, informed, it's sometimes it's, I feel like it's a facade. And I feel like really close to the surface is a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of un uncertainty about the future. and. I have ups and downs just like anyone else does and just because I happen to be put together and be able to do this today doesn't mean that I always look like this. I certainly have lots of sleepless nights worrying about my son, worrying about our future. I certainly um, feel inept at navigating systems. Um, so you, you can't assume because someone can speak in an educated way that they know how to navigate systems, that they have all the answers. And I had to learn pretty quickly that I needed to show my cracks to be able to get help. Because if you look too adept, you're not really given opportunities to access other resources. And yes to all of that. And um, you know, none of us have, and, and none of us have the right to judge or make assumptions about anyone. And you know, someone I may sound today, right at this moment, that I'm articulate, and um, who's to say that you know, I'm I'm really not. And similar to what Teresa's saying, um, we had to learn. We we kind of learned together our our kids are the same age and um, you know you learn how to advocate hopefully effectively and in a way that makes a difference for your family and then you also hope to build bridges with organizations that know that there are issues that are out there that don't just affect one or two families and um, you know but to, to not judge and to not make assumptions about anyone, I think, is really important. If people were just to make assumptions or judge our children, you know, based on what they see on the outside, you know, they're losing out on on getting to know some really awesome, awesome, uh, probably two of the best kids that I'll ever know. And that's just because I don't really know your kids very well. I'm going to close out this portion. We're almost ready to wrap up. Oh, did you have a comment? I just want to yep. say thank you so much. Um, you guys are just great. And I think for myself, I got always that feedback. Um, I was with Children's Special Health Care Needs, birth to three. Um, 
And what they used to say is like, well, if all the parents were like you, Kate, it would be a breeze, you know? And I always looked back at them and said, I'm just a mirror of you guys. Don't you see this? And I didn't, wasn't born this way. I didn't, wasn't born as the perfect mother for, Red, for a child with Red Syndrome. I, I mean, I had no experience in it. But where I grew was not only with my child and my family, was with the professionals that made that connection and partnership. And I learned very quickly that the systems in place for families with children with special needs really teach you well of your rights, but they didn't teach me well about building partnerships in those days. And we realized right away the, the success for my daughter and our family was building partnerships with the people that helped us and served us. So what I like to leave all these people with is when you have a family with a person with disabilities, that it's sort of like a garden and the seeds out there and you have a choice. You can trample down that seed or you can nurture that family to grow. And I really feel the reflection for me and as I'm sure with you folks as well, is that those professionals that came into our lives when we were all a mess and doing, you know, couldn't even stop crying, and you are right, if you're not in crisis, you get no help. So don't try to hold it together. I had to learn that. But when you finally make those partnerships, that's for me was what grew our family and made our family resilient to all the challenges that were coming every day through this journey. So my hat's off to you, and thank you so much. Thank you. Have, I have one more slide, I think one more slide. Get it up. One of the things we do at Vermont Family Network is we have a family faculty. Teresa and Shelley are both members of that. And we are, have the pleasure to go into UVM and St. Mike's and we speak to future doctors and special educators and nurses and, and um, physical therapists. And we teach family-centered care by telling the family stories. So that's a little taste of what you saw today. I don't really have a lot of time to discuss the benefits of person and family-centered care. So just briefly, I wanted to touch upon some as identified by the organization Family Voices that I had mentioned earlier with the One in Five campaign. Family Voices um, identifies the following benefits. The first being it improves the patient's and family's experience with health care. It reduces stress all around by having the person at the center. Definitely improved communication. I think you heard that come through pretty strongly in the stories that you heard. And kind of on the flip side of that, reducing conflict, which can sometimes end up in lawsuits. So that's a definite benefit. And then improving health and reducing costs. So all benefits of what we've talked about. Very last, I want to thank you all for being here today. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a plan with goals and objectives and action items. So I want to thank you all for bringing your heart to your work every day, each day, and helping the people that come into your lives and, and their families. So thank you for being here today, and I think Erin has a few closing remarks. before folks leave about what our next steps in the training series are. Um, as you all should know by now, this is a six-day training series, and we've kind of hit on that this is day one for this group. This group is going to be with the same cadre of trainers for the first three days, and then with the other training organization that was men mentioned, the Primary Care Development Corporation out of New York, for the last half of the training. So this group will be back um, in June for your next Right now that is scheduled for this location. We're working on exploring other options. We think we might be able to find something that's a little bit more um, cohesive to this type of training. So stay tuned for that. But everything will be communicated to you clearly um, in advance. So June 16th, back here Main Street Landing as of now. Um, the topics for that training are going to be universal design and accessibility, communication and interaction, tools for improved communication, cultural competence, and facilitating inclusive and accessible trainings for others. Um, we are going to send out registration links in advance of each of the six days, so just be looking for those. Holly Stone, who you might have met at the registration desk, um, takes care of those, so look for her email. Um, and just wanted to note that um, you know there was a little bit of concern about a great um, 
really wonderful outpour um, of folks that wanted to participate in this training. Everyone who's here, please come back. You have a spot, it's guaranteed. Um, we might open it up to other folks from other parts of the state that weren't able to get into another training location if we have extra spaces, but everyone here, please come back. Um, and also, on a final note, we're going to be doing a few supplemental um, webinars to augment the, the training content, so be looking for links to those. Those will come through in your email, and those will all be virtual, um, you know, kind of web-based formats. So more to come, and thank you all for your time, and everyone travel safe home and have a wonderful day. And I'm here if anybody has any questions specific to registration or dates or anything like that. Oh, and don't forget to put your evaluations at the desk on the way out. Thanks so much.